Hello Seal, we are back and this is going to be our first unsealed uh, stream of the season. Thank you all for coming out and I am joined by a slew of people here so I'm really excited to uh, introduce everyone. I am the Dragon Rider and then uh, uh, we have Autumn. How's it going Autumn? Going well. Nice to see that we have finally broken the arcane seal upon this podcast. <laughs> we have uh, Grease. Hey, how's it going? We have Squirrel Sensei. I'll sit. Ansem. Hello. And ZZ Dog. Hello, hello. Oh yeah. So we got we got a lot of people here. Uh, I can, I'm reading chat along with you guys as well. So if you have any questions, just. Uh, ring in and uh we'll do our best to answer them as quickly as possible but uh we're actually here to talk about a, a couple different things um mainly about like our as obviously the new season starting everything's starting to get going and we're gonna have some uh new league updates so i wanted to kind of discuss with all of us we have a like a vast like elo wise and also like people all throughout the community and uh, seal here just talking about um just uh, what's going to be happening next season what are the new changes obviously we got i ton of new upgrades and new things that you'll see across the league here and uh so first i wanted to talk about uh, objective bounties so um the objective bounties came in right and so now if uh there's a certain gold disparity at when uh turp plate falls i believe uh you will which team has the disparity will get uh, objective bounties so killing towers dragons and stuff like that so what's everyone's take on uh on this Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, I think that the bounties are nice in solo queue, um, but I don't know how that's going to translate when uh, we actually get into this competitive setting, because it's only a couple hundred gold. Um, for, for some of the higher divisions, uh, we'll probably see that matter a lot more since it'll be closer games. Mm -hmm. But for uh, so so for those of you who haven't looked at the website xd um <laughs> there are four divisions in this uh in this season um the two higher divisions i think you'll see that have a more of an impact with the lower divisions i think you're going to have um either so close of games that bounties aren't going to appear or such uh extremes that uh the bounties even with them it won't make up that much of a difference yeah, I've yeah I tend to agree here. Um, the big different, the big issue I see with them is whilst they feel great and they look great, and it provides a targeted thing to trade for in competitive play, it's not going to matter. You should teams that are doing well are already going to know how to push an advantage to the point where that extra hundred gold for killing a turret isn't going to matter. To isn't going to matter in the long run. They're just trading a turret, and they're probably already losing their mid, you know, their tier two somewhere, or worse, an inhibitor, depending how far back they are, and that's just not going to swing the game at all. So I, I actually disagree with you guys. Um, so I've been watching a lot of LPL this season. You know, it's been going for about two weeks now, and the trend that I'm starting to see is that, in my opinion, I mean, this may be a bit of a hot take, but the better of the two teams are winning more consistently. Whereas before, you know, maybe if we have a best of three series, the better team will win two and the worst team wins one. It feels like the better teams now are almost entirely shutting out teams that are even slightly worse than them. And why I think that is, is it's much harder to translate an early lead that you where you only outplay the enemy team in the early game into a hard win if you're getting outplayed by macro choices now because macro choices are way more valuable um and i know you're saying that objective bounties are only a couple hundred gold but it's important to remember the objective bounties go up on every objective at the map on the map simultaneously so there's a lot of them to collect and if the enemy team is not playing point guard well you can suddenly end up with a ton of objective bounties all at once yeah, I mean, I I agree with the sentiment, but I just don't think that that should actually happen. Like, even in the LPL, it, it doesn't really happen that way unless, like, a much better team just got mechanically outplayed in the early game and then come back. For, for the most part, a better team is going to be the team that's ahead, and they're going to consistently be playing well in point guard in a coordinated 
game like in a seal setting. Uh, for solo queue, like Ansem said, this is a pretty important thing. Uh, you can get back into the game using these, but in a competitive setting, it's really hard to actually find your opponent slipping so hard that they're letting you consistently get these. And getting one of them just isn't relevant enough to get you back. Because most of the time, if you're getting one, you're trading. And despite, you know, you technically trading up in a way, tra trading is still going to advantage the team that's winning unless you're trading a ton of stuff. Mm hmm yeah, for cast, like, I've casted a lot of SEAL games there, and uh, you, we, I kind of feel like objective bounties can be used accordingly, because you see, notice that a lot of teams, some team might be really, really good in, like, solo lanes and stuff like that, but their their macros might be uh, in a little bit of need of a work, so, I mean, if they can utilize these objective bounties and utilize its tempo um, with competitive play, as well as, as easy as you could shut it down, it's also just as easy to achieve those goals if you're faster and more efficient at doing it. So I feel like it's going to bring a whole different dynamic to team communication throughout the season. Yeah, but with that also being said here, let's, uh, like, we've talked about a little bit of objective bounties, and it's not obviously a be-all, be end-all kind of thing, but it has affected our Sulo queue a little bit there, but uh, I'm really excited to see how Seal is going to be uh, utilizing it as well. Um, next on our list here is actually uh, all the item changes that we got. We got a bunch of new items, some item changes, and so um, where do we begin with this one is the question. <laughs> I want to start with Crown. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that probably has the biggest uh, impact over uh, the entire game. I think, like, yeah, every everybody is by this point, everybody has been uh, hit by an Axiom Arc, uh, you know, Trindamir, Nocturne, Misfortune, Hell, Carthus. Uh, but uh, Crown of the Shattered Queen, uh, the, the the idea that. You already had a problem with champions like Cassidin, Diana, who uh, could already just instantly just delete somebody in the late game. But now for, what is it, three seconds after damage? Yeah, I think it's about three seconds nullifies the damage, or is it? Yeah, it, it's a 75% damage reduction for three seconds after it's shattered. Um it it has the same cooldown as uh, a banshee's, which is okay. Like, uh, it doesn't matter if the fight's over in those first five seconds. Um, so it, it's utterly disgusting that um, a champion that yes, it was already a problem. Um, I've I've already been victim to it in solo queue with uh, crown. Um, in, in like a. In my opinion, the best way to counter those kinds of champions that build this item is with a poke comp, um, because you just get rid of it, and then they, similar to how a banshee's worked, you just got rid of it, uh, and now their mythic is effectively useless. Um, uh, otherwise, I think the people kind of overvaluing Winter's approach. Um, it only works on just a couple of champions. Uh, and even then, it's like you're you're using it for a scaling item. I get that you're a tank, so you're going to scale, but it it doesn't scale for the stats uh, that I would deem the most important for you um, as like a first item, maybe like a third item when the tier is actually completed. But I I've seen players uh, build it first. Even before like boots, it's like oh boy, really? Stop that. <laughs> um, and I just don't think that's a wise decision. No, why do you? Um, why do you think that more people are building that like first? I can see it third item, like you were saying, because like I know on a lot of my champions, like they Orn, think that Nasus, the, and stuff like that, you'd want I, it like third. I, I think it's because the shield is so big at the beginning, effectively, that they think, oh, that's effectively an extra barrier that they have to get through it's like well yeah but you have no combat stats in effect like you have what health um i can get that from a bammy cinder that costs half as much mm -hmm. and can build into something useful um 
Fimble Winter scales better as the game progresses. So, uh, and plus the tier will also scale faster as it's a tier, not a Winter's approach. So, stop stop building your empowered one first. Um, the the only exception is like an Ezreal when he's building his uh, Monomune. Um, other champions that uh, build the because this was a change for tier in a whole. Um, because they also updated the uh, Seraph's Embrace. Sorry, I'm taking a lot of time for everybody else. But um, <laughs> uh, with tier being updated for Seraph's uh, to now give cooldown reduction based on your mana instead of a bonus AP, um, it, it's statistically better to keep it as the tier until it's ready to max out. The only item of those three tier items is the... Uh, uh, Monomune, uh, because it now can actually work off of your attacks, not just your abilities. Mm -hmm. um, All right. Oh, no, you go ahead. <laughs> I'll be quick. Uh, I think I agree with everything you said about Crown of the Shattered Queen. Um, only caveat I'd put is I I don't think that it's going to be super popular unless you're against a, a bursty character. Like I don't think it's just going to become core. People thought it was going to be core on Victor, but it's already shown to not be. Um, we're still getting a lot of Ludens. Um, but other than that, I mean, I agree. I think it's a great item at doing what it's designed to do, you know, stopping you from dying instantly. I hate it as an Elise main. It's, I think it's, you know, a scourge on my existence. Um, <laughs> item on this list I think is the most interesting is Even Shroud. It's basically the replacement for what Abyssal Mask was last season um but it's actually a lot of people don't realize for whatever reason that it's aoe so basically anytime you mobilize any champion in a 600 radius around you every enemy champion takes nine percent increased damage not just the target just super cool in my opinion um so even frontliners like if you're a diver and you hit uh, let's say leona hits them with that um sorry like if you're leona and you like q an orn in front of you and then dive the back line it's going to affect them too um, you're starting to see it in pro, but I think people are still hesitant because they don't really know the full. I don't. They don't know all the use cases and how to coordinate it yet. I think. But I think I think this item is going to become like core build on Leona, Nautilus, anything like that, only in the next month or so. Mm -hmm. um, anything that allows uh, tanks to, especially the more engaged heavy ones, the ability to actually basically guarantee a kill is the real is the real trick there right yeah you especially with like front to back wombo comps but sorry i, I cut you off yeah. well you know not just front to back but also like even in just like pick situations or dragon fights anytime you see an option where you have the ability to just jump on someone and basically just guarantee that this target is dead this is going to be powerful for those champions. And that's what this effectively does. As long as you have, you know, an AD carry or a mage behind you, they're lying. There's nothing they can really do about it. Mm -hmm. um, Shadow Flame, I think, is the most misunderstood item on the list overall in, like, what its power is. And um, so this item, it, it looks like something you'd want to build on someone who stacks Magic Pen. But... I've been I'm in a Discord that runs numbers on stuff like this, and apparently Shadow Flame is actually pretty bad on characters that stack Magic Pen because it'll often, especially if you build it as a second item, it'll result in just a lot of Magic Pen loss because they'll already be at zero if you have Sork Boots and Rocket Belt, for example. So what people are beginning to think this item is going to be doing is you're going to buy it on characters that actually don't get any other Magic Pen. Yeah. It, it it's also just straight up an anti-shield item, which, I mean, not in, you know, quite literally cutting through shields, but it yeah, makes, it, gives you a it, it, it punishes enchanters for existing is what it does, basically. Yeah. Which, for a lot of burst mages, that's the thing that a lot of them have been, like, itching to get their hands on for, yes, seasons? I think it's the best way to describe that. Since DFG was removed. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry to get it. Is uh, Reese is asking? Is Shadow Flame still bugged? I don't What's know what the, bug. What was the bug? I'm not aware of the bug. It wasn't calculating properly for a little while. 
That's what he says. I'm I'm not sure. I th I'm not sure if that's bugged. Um, what I was referring to is just that it's it's still not going to stack further than people having zero MR. Um, yeah, you, you can't get negative magic like magic resistance. <laughs> yeah, people that have been hoping. Well, that was a mechanic a long time ago. You could actually get people below zero, but I think they removed that. No way! Like, since like Twisted Tree Line was in the game, dude. What? <laughs> what? what yeah, it's, been, it's been gone for a while. I have more questions. Did that just heal the person? Was it? Like, <laughs> did oh, it? No, it, it, you would do like uh, multiplicative damage. So if like you went into negative MR, you would do like 110 percent damage or something like that. Oh my gosh! Yeah, more than it was basically a free extra item. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's broken. <laughs> Yeah, yeah no, it was a bit there's, silly. There's a reason it's gone. Uh, <laughs> that's why LeBlanc kept one-shotting me. <laughs> I mean, that's just because she is LeBlanc. You die instantly. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm a tank. I'm a tank. Right. Well, if it uh, can be my turn now, I do have some things I want to disagree with Ansem on. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Winter's Approach, I think, is actually very strong. Uh, th this item is actually ridiculously cracked when you get to Fimble Winter, and the the reason for it is it's very easy to like just abuse the sustain, especially if you get it early enough. Uh, like say you're first iteming this on Gragas, and you take Phase Rush, you can literally just trade, never get traded back on because of the shield. Just walk out, and when it's off cooldown, you can just do it again and walk away with Phase Rush, and you just insta win lane. You just have permanent sustain, and you can actually do this with a lot of champions that are. It's kind of hidden OP on. Like, you can do this with, like, Lissandra and other things, too. Fimble Winter is one of those items I don't think has been explored enough uh, in weird builds yet. It's one of those things that I think, like, three months down the road, uh, Duinby is going to have, like, some cracked Rise Fimble Winter tech, <laughs> and you're just going to see that this is just going to be built on <laughs> a lot of, this like, is now mid -range the mages. I mean, I'm just straight up just looking at this and thinking, as a tree support, like, as a Maokai support, this is interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, it, the, like annoying things is you use so much mana running the saplings or running just anything, and just, you know, tank supports in general. This is interesting. Tanks with more mana is great. I love playing tanks, and when I have more mana to do more things, it's awesome because I build war mugs and I just go around being like, I never have to back ever again. <laughs> just become a menace for like twenty minutes. But uh. Uh, I was also going to talk about the uh, the arc here, so Axiom Arc. Uh, has anyone witnessed the uh, Nocturne on this? Yep. Yep. Has have anyone? You, so you faced this off before. How how did it go? How did it go for you? Um, sorry. Uh, the one I saw was uh, Cadrill getting Nocturne ulted three times in <laughs> in under a minute. No. <laughs> um. That that was before the nerf. But still, <laughs> um, so twenty five percent CD off instead of twenty percent. Um, that was that Anybody was. Anybody remember that brief couple patch cycles where Lux had that thing? If she killed someone with her yep. ultimate, it was refunded by about thirty seconds, which meant you had a Lux literally machine gunning a freaking murder laser. Yeah, you had oh TFT Lux. Oh my god, that sounds uh, awful. <laughs> yeah, that was that was there for a couple of patches. Um, basically, yeah. you just picked Lux's support because she can exist there, had a normal mid laner, and then just had her spamming. Jeez. Now, with all of these new items, what do you guys think? Um, will this change like core game dynamic, especially in like a um, sealed like seal environment, like co like competitive? Do you think this is going to change games if utilized correctly? Um, what's your take on this, like uh, for the competitive scene? Like for Axie Mark specifically? No, for all of them. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry for for all these um, items, all these new items. Obviously, it brings a whole new dynamic to the game and a bunch of different think, build paths that we haven't seen before. I think the most impactful that we'll probably see is, I, I guess, with uh, ZZ Dog, his is probably going to be Fimble Winter, and after doing B, uh, cracks open the code, and then, um, I would think it would be Evan Shroud, actually. Mm -hmm. Um. Because uh, you still see supports, at least like the tank supports will still go like lock it as their like standard. Like this is what I go, but um, I... those that that are like actually open to 
you know, new ideas. Um, I'm not one of those. Um, <laughs> are like the Leonas, Nautilus, uh, Thresh, those kinds of champions are going to see Evan Shroud and go, ooh, that's hot. Yeah. What so, do you guys- I'm oh, looking ahead. at this as a non-repentant Lulu spammer, and I'm frankly terrified. <laughs> because, like, three out of four items brought up here are items that are a giant middle finger to squishy, shield-bearing, enchanter supports with no mobility. You're gonna get jumped on, you're gonna get extra damage thrown at you, you're gonna have extra damage through your shields, and then you're gonna have that random Zed that you thought you'd stop is gonna pop up, like, ten seconds later with another ult, and you can't do anything about it. Yeah. So, like, as a su- from the support side of bottom lane, we are going to be seeing changes, if not in strategy well, in terms of build, we're going to be seeing changes in terms of how you actually, in terms of champions. Mm. Well, of all of these items, at least the ones that I see on the screen, nothing really changed for AD carries. I do like to actually run Crow, uh, Crown of the Shattered Queen on Kaisa ADC. Yeah, I, I was about to mention this. Uh, there's actually a lot of really awkward Crown ADC builds. Like, uh, Kaisa has one with, like, Nasher's <laughs> Tooth and uh, Crown, and then Ezreal also has a really disgusting one that has, like, a 58% win rate right now. I'm actually where he goes, uh, like... Yeah, he goes Essence Reaver, Tear Item into Crown. No. <laughs> oh my so god. Here's a so terrifying and dumb thought. What if you just ran, like, for example, Winter's Approach on Ezreal, someone who just sucks mana? Well, see, okay, so that's the funny thing I was also going to talk about is, can you imagine, uh, remember when Ezreal was going double tier? Can you imagine yeah, if that was a thing right no, now? No. If you have Archangel's <laughs> Fimble Winter Rise, how disgusting <laughs> no, I that would, would be. Oh I would actually God. just wait until the next patch before I like, can, yeah. go playing again. <laughs> I, I missed two tier, if nothing like, else, but for this, it, like triple tier item, man, it'd be so crazy. For certain AD carries, there is a benefit to these items. And it's one of those, like, it, it, it depends on how ult-relevant ult you are, how mana-hungry you are, how bursty you are. Like, there's a world where, like, you're, you, you, you drag Corky, we drag Corky back down to the bottom lane, and Corky likes Winter's Approach, Corky would like something like Shadow Flame to an extent, mm-hmm. like, well, standing. I'm... Well, Corky's... Corky's build Shadow Flame right now sometimes. Yeah. I mean, uh, like, Corky is one of those champions right now that I just don't know how they're going to deal with. Because it, they almost have to nerf his ultimate, which feels really bad because that's like all he has. But his ultimate is so cracked with itemization and he's like the only person abusing it. it it's yeah. so sad. I, I don't know at all how they deal with that champion right now. I think the package is definitely a point they could look at too. Well, I mean, he doesn't I even need it, though. Fine. Like, right I now, he's big fine. one ulting people with first strike and poke build, and he does two thirds yep. their HP. It's disgusting. With, yeah, with no, one you don't even one. need package to just play Corky, you get the three items, and just 1v9 the game. Yep, I've done it. Yep, <laughs> you don't even need to be good. You just hit one ult. Yeah, it's disgusting. <laughs> I have yet to see this. I'm kind of terrified now. I haven't played yeah, this. So, oh, no, it, it will. It will probably. He's Corky's either going to be pop banned up in seal. or it, yeah, it, or he's coming out practically first game in seal. Oh like, gosh. Also, yeah. j- just because we haven't touched on it, the the most impactful item change to me is actually Archangels. I, I think that the CDR change instead of AP is just disgustingly awful, and this item is being built still when it shouldn't be. It's just a bad item on like nine of ten champions. Still well, because I, I think that people were switching to that from the uh, Cosmic Drive because now that's the item to get your CDR. Mm. I mean, I just don't think you really need the CDR from it. No, but like the champions that were building Cosmic for the CDR is now building Archangels for the CDR. Yeah, but those builds were already troll. Like when people were yeah. going like Leandre's Cosmic Drive LeBlanc, it's just terrible. And then now they're going like Leandre's Archangels, and it's even worse. I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> not building these items. They're so <laughs> but, bad. They but, don't but that's do anything. Just what you do negative changed. damage. Mm. One item I'm really curious about is Abyssal Mask. Have you guys seen what Abyssal Mask does now? No. I have no idea. Isn't it the build AOE MR reduction? Yeah, it's a- so it reduces all enemies within 550 units 
MR by five plus one percent of your bonus health capped at twenty MR. Um, and then you get seven bonus magic resistance yourself for each enemy in the area. Uh, like this seems actually potentially really good. It also gives four hundred fifty health, but I just don't know who this is itemized for. Horn. Horn. Yeah. Horn. So? <laughs> Horn. Uh, Malkai is pretty good with this. Uh, Gragas I, probably I, would be if he can build it. I, I think the thing yeah. is, uh, when it comes to a lot of these tank items, is that a lot of the time. Uh, and I think Riot is starting to realize this, is that uh, they make items that are geared towards a support to build, and then it just costs too much, and no tank player is ever actually going to build it. Uh, the same thing happened with Rylize, where it's like, it's geared towards some mid lane mages, but also supports, and now they're changing that next patch to be more support focused. I feel like they should just do this with items like Abyssal, where the passive is so obviously geared at a support player to just build the second or even first item in some spots. But they just can't because it's costs way too much. Yeah, I, I mean it's it has a good passive for sure, but like no tank players building this over like Force of Nature because Force of Nature is just cracked. Yeah, that's true. It, it also just comes down to the fact that when Riot builds things for supports, they're I, I swear someone out there thinks that like for some reason supports are somehow magically getting like the full ten thousand gold on an average match or whatever it is that yeah. others and it's closer to like. Mm, a really bad support might make 5,000 gold. On average, you're closer to 8,000, and that's if you're actually like on fire that patch or that game. Yeah. So like, yeah, you're like, already looking at you're looking at a really tiny gold really, worth. Realistically, the only champion that I really see building Abyssal Mask is probably Orn as, yeah. as a realistic option. Um, like that would I, I see that too. Yeah, because uh, he's going to be in the muck of it. Uh, people are going to try to dive him to stop him from getting his ult off. So he's probably going to get the most, quote unquote, most benefit out of it. Um, there are champions that can build it, but I, I just it, it's it's a lot better than he was. Um, but it, it's it still needs something to push it just that a little bit extra. Yeah, it's it feels like it's going in the right direction, but it just lacks identity, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually think it's the opposite. I think it has an identity. It just like has it costs way too much, it, because like like I said earlier, it's so obviously geared at supports, right? Like mm -hmm. if you're a top laner, even if you're Orn, you always want Font. You, you always want Force of Nature because this item just makes you like unkillable by mages just standing in the front line because it gives you so much MR value. And even though the Abyssal Mask passive has a good identity and is like a good passive, and you definitely would like to have it, you're you're never building more than one MR item realistically, mm -hmm. unless the enemy team has just drafted nothing but AP because MR items are just so bad. Yeah, like so five, you just yeah. so you only buy Fawn and you stack armor from there. So you never buy Abyssal, and the only person who would ever buy Abyssal is a support who can't afford it. So if they just like decreased its stats and its gold value by four hundred, like they're doing with Rylize, I think people would buy this as a support. Otherwise, I don't think people buy it. Yeah, I think that's a fair observation. Mm -hmm. With hey. all the flat pen introduced to the game, so they introduced 40 more flat pen, 20 potentially on Abyssal Mask and 20 on Shadow Flame. And then, of course, you have 18 on Sorks, and there's a Mastery. Um, sudden Impact can reduce it by 6, so on and so forth. Um, obviously, you have Rocket Belt, which is 6 plus 5 um, per legendary item. I wonder if there's almost a world where you can actually run more AP champions this season than you previously could. Like, you could build a comp around something like Abyssal. I, I'm just spitballing here at this point, but it'd be really interesting to see something like that. Mm -hmm. I think there's a possibility of it, but it's kind of kind of come down to a situation more than anything else. And whether or not, you know, that flat pen actually has, can realistically, reasonably act against even one tank, let alone if they see that and someone's like, oh, they're building all mages. Let's just triple stack tanks and have a couple of 80 carries behind it. Woo! Because <laughs> we all know how fun those metas were. I love tanks. <laughs> Although the tank metas are fine. It's when you have, like, four of them and a hyper carry where it's sad. Right. <laughs> well, I actually think tanks right now are so sad because they get outscaled. Yep. Like, yep. tanks right now get outskilled by three items. Tanks are supposed to be, like, these scaling threats that, you know, 
they become these big meatballs that you can't deal with if they get too big. But no, you can just always deal with them and they don't do anything. It, it's yep. so sad the state the tanks are in right now. They're actually peaking mid game, which should never happen. Mm-hmm. What do you think the, the cause of that is? Do you think that um, armor well, just, is too cheap or just the items aren't good enough? Well, no, it's just the meta right now because everyone's playing hypers. Everybody plays hyper carries, and the hyper carries do enough damage to just kill the tanks always. And so Riot needs to find a way to make hypers not as valuable, which is going to be really hard because you've basically perma buffed enchanters by making it so top lane can't TP. So oh, now enchanters yeah. just get to lane for free, which makes hypers more valuable. So it's like it's which a chain reaction a from the chances. teleport change that basically makes you incentivized to just play enchanter hyper carry every game. Mm-hmm. Argue too that, at least in my opinion, I think that the objective bounties are pushing the game time to be much later on average. I mean, I feel like I'm witnessing this in pro. You're seeing mostly scaling picks that, of course, encourage hyper because if your opponent picks hyper, that means you can pick hyper. You know, it's going to be a scaling lane. Um, I think that the trend is just going to continue this way unless they adjust the fact that early game champions. They have to be so much better their, than their opponents to have any chance at winning at a high level. Yeah, you can't, currently you can't drop incentive. a play. Yeah, there's you can't drop a play. Drop and, like, for example, mid can't really risk roaming down because, you know, if mid dies, that's very bad. And the odds that you're actually going to be able to kill that hyper carry aren't looking too great because. You know, the worst you can get it out is 4v4. Now, yes, the worst you can get is 4v4. Now, as a bot laner, that's great. Because, well, yes, people may hate enchanters. At the same time, it feels really, really terrible to know that you're never going to get to lane because someone's going to teleport in at five minutes and well, now there's the entire team in my lane. What am I going to do? Mm-hmm. So, there is there is a bit of give and take on that one. I do think that, those, that the item changes here actually are slightly scary to enchanter players. Because they 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 attract what enchanters do almost directly, so I think they have a good idea of what they can do about that issue. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's uh, actually move on to our next topic. Here. <laughs> We've been talking about items a lot, and now let's uh, talk about uh, dragons. The dragon changes. We were introduced oh, to boy. the chemtech and go. the hextech, and uh, they. <sighs> Uh, basically, I, I, for me personally, they've just—they're so overpowered. Like the, 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 where the air dragon just feels like all the other dragons feel so inferior when these two come up. But uh, that's just my take on it. Like you see these guys in action, and there's just it changes the entire game based off just if you see one of these things appear. What's your guys' take on this? Fog is awful. Remove fog. All my yeah, homies like, hate fog. <laughs> yeah, like like Chemtech, uh, Soul. Whenever that comes up, if you're on the losing side of the map, you ju- you basically just surrender at that point because you're never like even getting past your uh, side of the jungle. Um, like also- it it actually feels so oppressive that you can't do anything. Mm-hmm. Even after like it's been nerfed like what like two three patches in a row it doesn't matter like I think the, it's getting nerfed again. No, okay. The, the oh, camouflage oh, that it is. gives you is so oppressive. You know I... What the worst part about Chemtech Dragon Soul is it it's not even a win more dragon. It actually does so little if you're winning. It makes the game last forever and you're stuck on the worst rift imaginable. <laughs> because the soul doesn't give the winning team a win condition. Because it, it, the soul only matters in a team fight. If you're getting picked off, which is the like losing team's only way back in, it does nothing because you just die again. Like li- literally, it runs this is not a win more soul. It is a soul that only helps a losing team or a winning team that can't close and it just has to five v five you because they're bad. Like it, it's such a terrible soul. And I, it makes you sit on that terrible rift for like 35 minutes where if the other team just rolled Infernal Soul, they'd sprint over you in 20. It's so, so terrible. I hate it so much. It's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how you um, really feel. Way, like, looking at, <laughs> like, you really feel. Yeah, looking at it objectively, the Dragon Soul itself is of dubious at best utility because the team that's winning is usually the team that's getting the soul anyway. And it's a soul that increases. Like, like, 
First of all, the, the Scion Pats of the Y, oh right? God. And then there's the buffs per dragon, which is a scaling current health for percentage damage, which, by the way, stacks with the fog. I had no idea the fog did that. That makes the fog worse. And that only matters to exactly one, one player on the enemy well, team. All right, and let that's me, the AD carry, because they're the only one who's going to have a low enough health threshold to actually activate that. So I have a different opinion about the Chemtech Dragon. I actually like it. I do think it needs to be adjusted for sure. It's too too good. Um, and I, I totally agree with what ZZ Dog said. There's not a win more dragon, but I think it does have an identity. So I think the, I would call the Chemtech Dragon an end the game dragon, right? It's a so it's the, dragon. It's the only dragon soul that you have to spend gold to use. And what I mean by that is. The only time you will ever activate this soul is if you just gave the team the enemy team at least 300 gold, assuming you're winning. <laughs> so it costs money to use it. So the only time this dragon soul actually has significant value, I mean this is a pretty broad stroke, but is when you're it's when you're pushing the base to end the game. Because that's when you don't care about that extra um for the cost of using it. And the only thing that matters is having one person survive a team fight. It doesn't matter that everyone else else on your team just got slaughtered twice in a row. It's the end of the game, Dragon. That's my take on it. Um, the Fog, you know, I'll let other people speak on that. I'm kind of ambivalent. I think it's a cool idea. I think it's interesting. Um, it, it makes vis vision control harder for both teams. So there's the argument that if you're losing, you can't enter your jungle, and that really sucks. But the enemy team also can't use regular wards anymore. So they can't have as much vision control without physically standing there. Um, so you see the thing you saw you saw in like LCS over the weekend where people are dropping wards like on the outside of the raptor pit and whatnot. That's all I have yeah, to say in, about in the, that. Like, so, sorry, but no, as you were saying, saying with those with those like really like ingrained into support's minds for any of you who have played support, it's easy dog. Um, you and I both know like there there are certain ward positions that are just absolutely horrible to have to place, but because of how the the fog works, you have to put those in those spots because those are the only places you can see something. That is like Mountain Drake, but worse in that sense because Mountain Drake also makes life somewhat hell for warding. Yeah, but at least with Mountain Drake, you still could like work around with that. Yeah, you, you could place words in places where it's like, okay, this isn't as great, but I can at least get vision going in and out. Yeah, like and then there's a, this. Yeah, like on a scale of one to ten with the mountain soul, you would get like a six. Uh maybe maybe like a four at the worst. With with chem soul, you're putting a zero right there on a scale of one to ten. Like you're placing the most horrible wards. And even if you place the pink wards that do see the enemy champions, it's only like this small little pocket that you see. So they could be behind you just waiting for you to get just a little bit closer and then collapse and you're dead. Congratulations, you won the game because your opponent, not because they didn't uh, play around the vision that uh, they would have had correctly, but the vision that Riot decided you're not allowed to have because of this map. And going off of that there, so how do you expect teams to play competitively with the, the fog there? Do they have to go um, in together? How is, uh, like, in a competitive environment and you have comms with all five of your members, what are they supposed to be doing here? Well, so you have a one in, what, one in five? One in six, one in six chance of getting that soul. Um, so the, the meme answer is just to roll the dice and hope you didn't get that. Um... The other one is, uh, um, you know, you're you're already in bad positions to fight in corridors usually uh, for sealed because in sealed what we've had that have worked for a lot of teams has been team fights, and team fights do really well in chemtech, uh, just because it's like oh you don't see anybody and then all of a sudden you hear Pikachu coming out and <laughs> electrocuting your whole team. Um, so for here, I think it's going to be more emphasis to, uh, the teams to not fight in these bad corridors, uh, cause you don't know what's coming out of that. Uh, like you effectively have to treat the entire jungle now as a giant bush. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know that there's either a Garen or a Rengar in that bush. Like, <laughs> you just have to assume that. 
so you're going to be fighting more towards the dragons and the barons uh, to try to close out. You're not really going to be looking into uh, into the into the jungles if you don't have proper control outside of them. Mm-hmm. If you don't have like it's going to be more communication uh, for gaining knowledge between the laners to their junglers on where everybody is. Um, and yeah, <laughs> like I, I just I really hate Chemtech. Um, <laughs> it, it is one of the worst ways that they could have designed this as possible. I think. So we um, we have what we they, hate, but now let's flip this coin here and see how Hextech. How what do you guys feel about the gates? How are these gates? Oh, that's actually fun. I yeah. think they're awesome. I, I think that they enable teams to play against counter-engage comps as engage comps, for one. They allow flanking against teams that normally can't be flanked against. Um, I think they're awesome, personally. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Hex Tech Dragon, in, in like comparison, like you have the Hex Gates, obviously, you can roam around the map, get those good, like the positioning and everything. And then with the Soul is... Uh, it gives you what a static shiv. Everyone's got static yeah. static shiv, basically. Yeah. Like, how how does that work in the in the team vibrant? Is that like the different from? Uh, is that going to be like an infernal where it just ends the game in team fights, or is it just I, something I that's, that's just better infernal? It's actually just better infernal. It's infernal with a slow, basically. Mm. It's so strong because yeah. mm-hmm. uh, also with it, you with the individual dragons, you get attack speed and uh, uh, ability haste with it, don't you? Yeah. I think so. yeah, yeah, so, it's not yeah, very so much it's, though. It's like five percent. Yeah, but it, it it does feel that little bit nicer. Um, so I I I like it a lot. Um, something something that I actually forgot about that somebody mentioned in the chat with uh Chemtech real quick. Just to backtrack with that real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, Rengar got a buff recently that whenever he goes into camouflage, he can jump. Wait. Rengar Senna coming in, boys. Oh That's my god! Are you ready for it? Twelve point two. I'm ready. Rengar. That's Rengar next Senna. Patch. Oh my yep. god! It, it, yeah, it, 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 ironically, as soon as Rengar hits six, he has his alt whenever he's in Senna. E. Are you ready? I sure am. Oh I'm gonna have god. a lot of fun. That is. That's not scary for eighty carries everywhere. It's not scary. It it's getting worse. Next patch, they're ner- they're nerfing Lulu, and it's like the only thing. That oh, can no. Stop. oh no, they're nerfing no. Lulu. Oh no, like it's good they're nerfing Lulu, right? But at the same time, like you're making that thing happen, and you're removing, you're basically killing the one champion who's actually decent at stopping that kind of thing from happening. Eh. So, is pretty good at stopping it. Yeah, but that yeah. also requires something called skill. So yeah, I mean, Janet's also getting buffed. Uh, Lulu is uh, definitely too strong i say this as an adc who's abusing hypers like lulu is just way too strong yeah mm-hmm. well moving on to our uh, our next subject here unless anyone has any final uh, takeaways from the dragon it's changes super short yeah it's mm-hmm. just um the next patch it looks like they're changing chemtech fog to have a short cooldown if you were in combat when you so like you can't just jump over and over as if you're standing in a bush with rengar yeah no, it's, it's not, it's not, just make the dragon fog do damage and not <laughs> camouflage. Just make it do damage. Oh, by the way, would you say like staying <laughs> in there Remove hurts you? The camouflage. Would that Jeez, like terrible. Would that just hurt like, junglers though? Like uh, squishy no, junglers? <laughs> what, if it, like, to your, what if it reduced your reduce, like, star- Yeah, just reduce some yeah, stats. Reduce stats. Uh, everybody has Morello to buff when they're in fog. I don't care. Just mm. get rid of camouflage. Just get rid of the camouflage. Like, Everyone hates the camouflage, please. Fair point, fair point. Now let's move on here. We got teleport changes. I know uh, someone actually brought this up uh, before Topside. I think it was you, Ansem, who was talking about teleport changes. I can't remember. Uh, I I touched on it briefly when yeah. I was talking about why hypers were too strong. Yeah, so we yeah, got, it was it was easy dog. Yeah, so it's easy. We got the new teleport, and honestly, I think this is just bot lane protection services. Because uh, as you saw, like in competitive play, like something happens bot lane, and you have everyone on the map bot side. Because <laughs> top yep. laners would just TP down, mid laners would TP down, but now you have to oh, TP yeah, to oh. towers, right? So it does uh, provide a little bit of a different mechanically, 
like um and does change the top lane meta slightly just because you aren't going to be tp'ing bot at like three minutes yeah, I think the single biggest side effect of this is it allows bot lane to actually be bot lane for just a little <laughs> bit longer. Oh, let, let me interject right there. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't like the new TP changes um, in like a sort of way where um, now that the top laners can't TP bot, you have the jungler pretty much sitting bot. Um, oh. There has... I think there has not been a game since this change where the jungler doesn't camp bot or um, instead of the mid TP to like the turret for a dive, he's already roaming bot as well. Like, it hasn't really changed the um, the team fighting bot side. It just kind of just shifted where the jungler just has to pretty much sit bot side down. I, as a, I mean, I have I have a lot of thoughts on this. I, and on as, as a top laner here, uh, I uh, never have seen a gank in my life. <laughs> yeah, like so. Here's the thing on that one, right? Like you say that like they're sitting bot, like that's a change. It isn't. Uh, junglers have been camping bot side for the no last way. Lord only knows how many seasons. And like all the what the biggest effect it does is it now forces like if you want to gank bot, you actually have to push and you have to guarantee that you have the space but I, if you don't I, mean, I think then that, uh, you can get punished it opens up punishment for mid lane it obviously makes <laughs> top lane i'm sorry top lane back to the <laughs> island with you right well no so top lane i think it actually changed top lane very drastically because of this mm -hmm. i agree um, um because for for the longest time you would have top laners uh primarily play these tanks because uh or like these hard engaged champions or something uh to then tp down bot and be that front line f when the 5v5 at uh eight minutes happens well now top lane is much more volatile where you actually have like a lot more carry style champions showing up um you don't have to have uh the the top lane tank anymore because you don't you're not planning to have that front line. And as uh, we've already mentioned before, with all the changes for items, uh, hyper carries are so much more prevalent now. Why would you put a tank up there when they're going to get absolutely blasted the second they do show up bot lane? Like, at, at least with a damage dealer, probably ranged. I hate that. Um, they're actually going to be able to do something rather than just walk in and die. Well, this actually mm -hmm. begs the question then: is with this and with uh, how prevalent, you know, hard spiking AD carries are, is there now impetus to start seeing assassins? Not necessarily. I mean, we already are, right? Another, we like, already are now. That's already the jungle meta. Basically, is bruisers and assassins. You have like Diana Yasuo coming in Talon. to get you engage. You have like Zed jungle, Talon jungle, both performing very well, though they're getting nerfed. Uh, you. I mean, you're going to see a lot of that stuff, yep. and it, people need to find ways of dealing with all the hypers, and they really can't right now. That said, I disagree with you on a lot of points you just said, Ansem, because the, the truth of the matter is this TP change isn't what's gating tanks. Tanks haven't been meta in a while. Carry top laners have been the meta for like the past year and a half. So, more so, the way that TP has altered top, specifically the TP change, is that now top lane, I agree, is more volatile because you can no longer reset waves with TP. It's much easier to freeze on people because they can't TP to a minion and force you off. They mm -hmm. have to TP to the tower. And it really, really screws your top lane matchup if you don't have your jungle there to reset your wave for you. So it's actually really big. You can lose a lot of CS and XP early if you're not coordinated with your jungle. That said, this TP change was kind of necessary because what it sought to do and what it does do is it prevents level 3 TP dives which were just all over the place in pro and were just aids to deal with as an AD carry or a support. What, what happens is uh, you just get stack, a wave stacked on you if you don't have uh, ways to clear the wave, and then you get dove on level 2 while the enemy bot lane is level 3 by the jungle and the top lane who's TPing down, and the only way to stop that is your, uh, your mid and your top both TPing the tower. Mm -hmm. And then everybody just walks back to lane like nothing happened, and it's just the worst. And you just lose two waves. Yeah, so I think like, with, yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
No, it's like it's one of those things where it feels absolutely terrible for top laners for this to happen, <gasps> but it's necessary because bot lane couldn't deal with it. There was like no counterplay to it. Now top lane, the only counterplay though is to have your jungle there. So now there's no real counterplay to that either. It's so sad. I don't know how Riot really fixes this. Because, I mean, they need to do something to make it, like, playable for top lane. Yeah, well, going off what you said and what we've uh, discussed before as well, is like, so we've heard that we need to, like, junglers need to say bot, but, like, if top lane's losing and you need the jungler top lane as well, it really puts jungle in, like, a really bad scenario where they have to be split along some map there. So what do you think uh, teams are going to do to counteract this? Is it just going to be different champion styles or different, like, you have to win, it's, win it's lane, win game, have top to side? completely change their styles, I think. Yeah. What yeah, you're seeing, to... some of what you're seeing already is that weak side top laners are coming back. You're starting to see Malphite in Asia a lot. You're starting to see Orn. Um, Malachi's terrible, or I think you would see him, but he was nerfed like four times in season 10 and then never touched again. Mm -hmm. um, but you're going to see champions that don't need resources to function top lane. Shen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you well, see a Shen's lot of, literally uh, getting hit and empty space of that, actually. Like, literally, this, like, 12 2, he's taking a hit to his damage specifically because he can cross map. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you're going to see is, like, you see top laners who can int to reset the wave, basically. Like, like you have tanks that can just lose their entire HP bar to reset the wave by themselves so the jungle doesn't have to come top, and then they reset. And then they just do that off cooldown. And they'll wind up missing, like, two minions uh, every two waves or something, but they'll get enough resources to still be relevant until, like, three items, in which case they're outskilled. And that's just the meta now. And that's why you're seeing stuff like Inting Scion, which unironically <laughs> dies to get a tower plate, and that's just his goal now, because the thing. wave is so... Like, he's getting cucked out of so much farm that he literally just has to int and die and it make it worth, and somehow it works, because that's just the state of top lane right now. It's so sad. <laughs> I mean, Inting Scion started, well, like, the middle of last season... Oh yeah, no, I'm aware it started a while ago, but like now it's actually getting picked in pro. Like it's uh, getting, I getting a lot of <laughs> yeah, it's getting a lot of traction now because top lane has just gotten worse because TP isn't a thing anymore. What mm. I'm hearing is uh, inting Scion ultimate NA strategy. Yeah, <laughs> it's not right. even NA strategy. It starts in EU, man. EU strats. Yep. <laughs> I Office. agree to the. Sorry to cut you off sort of there. I, I was just going to say, I agree with you that it's a big issue that you can't TP to reset waves, but I think that the reason they made this change is also your other point of like the un, the uncounterable t tower dive for TP was just, it was every game in pro. Like in Worlds, it literally happened every single game from semis onward. Yep. Mm -hmm. it's, un, it's, it's nothing you can do. If they have a better comp at level three or whatever, they're just going to dive you on third wave top and you're dead. Mm -hmm. It's basically making a right makes it was making a choice here as which side has to deal with the uncounterable crap. And well, it has been top. In too. their estimation, right? Their estimation is Colin. top side <laughs> is so better, wrong. is better positioned in terms of champions, in terms of item state to deal with that. I just don't think they also expected hyper carries to get so ridiculously powerful in the same time. So good well, job, Riot. Just to be clear, this this play was happening on top side also. Because the top laners can't TP to stop a play that's happening to them. So you would see jungle push in the wave, the thir third wave, slow push crash with the top laner, and then the mid laner would TP top instead of the top laner TPing bot. So it was happening on both sides of the map. It was pretty oppressive, and I don't know, it was kind of lame to watch. Mm -hmm. The one thing I will say is a lot of people are just choosing not to take TP anymore. And I think that's a bit of an overreaction. Like, there's a lot yeah. of spots where TP is just, like, still your best laning some. That, and people just don't take it because they're, like, completely undervaluing it for no reason. The, the change is bad, but, like, the fact that mid lane just is refusing to take TP at all anymore is kind of uh, a little bit suspect. Like, it, the, the spots you were taking TP before, you can still take TP. Mm hmm one thing that I think is super interesting about this change is it solidifies the 14-minute mark as just being mid-game. Like, we had plates last season, sure, that was 14 minutes, but that was the only thing. But now we have plates falling off, objective bounties being engaged, and now unleash teleport. So it really does mark a transition in game state, which I think is kind of cool.
Yeah, mid-game TP seems a lot better now because obviously we can see that it like scales and now when it becomes unleashed, it's only on a 240 second cooldown opposed to when it was slowly scaling down before, right? So. Yeah, and there is some compensation right at 14 minutes. If your TP is on cooldown, the cooldown, remaining cooldown gets really uh, reduced. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but it was in the notes. Or somebody wants to mm. fill me in. That'd be great. I don't remember the exact number. Uh, any final takeaways for the teleport changes? Alrighty, let's go check out the scuttle crab changes. We got the baby bug, baby. <laughs> so this affects our junglers. Before, remember how valuable scuttle crab used to be, right? And it was like do or die. It became like you picked jungle and you picked mid lane for a two v two that you knew was going to happen as soon as scuttle crab like spawned, right? And if you ever double crab, you just win. Exactly, exactly. So with this scuttle crab change, how do you think this uh, changes the jungle dynamic? It's just so comedically terrible. Like, has anyone ever seen a jungler actually take this and looked at their XP bar go up? <laughs> yeah, it's awful. It's so useless. It's such a bait. And junglers are still fighting for it anyway. So, like, literally, people are fighting over this and coin flipping the game at level 3, and now there's not even any reason to do it. It's so tragic. It was the mentality, right? You know, they, they you've been doing it for yeah, like no, they, years to fight, they, fight they to the crit death. Far. <laughs> they just went way too far. I agree they should have like reduced the value, but 80% reduced is so extreme. Isn't that worth like a little Krug or something like that? <laughs> is it really? <laughs> oh my god. It feels like it. I think it's like small wolf or something. Okay. It's like nothing. Uh, so if you're at level 3 flat, exactly like 0 XP level 3, and you take Scuttle Crab, it'll fill your bar by 20%. It's nothing. <laughs> you would need 5 of them to level up. Nothing. What, what like is the like uh like do you get good gold like compensated I mean, yeah, for that? Like, gold. Yeah. The gold is still like 120, but like if you lose it it's not that big of a deal. People should really be giving it more when they can't fight. So, I mean, like nerf to the EXP aside, this is a really relieving change for the jungle um because the one really nice thing that this does in my opinion as a jungler is um, we're no longer going to have this awful problem that we had all last season where any time a character becomes able to clear faster than 310, they're the best jungler in the game. Because the first crab, getting there first or getting both of them, has almost no impact on the game whatsoever. So what you're seeing is that people are just, you know, they're more comfortable picking stuff that doesn't clear as fast, which I think is good. Now, that impacts laners, though, because some of the characters that don't clear as fast that are strong are characters that are like permic anchors, like Rek'Sai, Elise, Lee Sin, and Zen, a few of which were already good. They're now better. So you see Lee Sin, Diego, and um, Zen banned every game in pro because the only thing that they had, the only negative they had was that they couldn't clear fast enough to like six camp into scuttle, and now that doesn't matter. So. Mm -hmm. No. We get this like super super carnivorous jungle meta where we just try to kill champions instead. There, there was one jungler in particular that I had a question about. It was the kindred where you could potentially get two kindred marks off of two skull crabs? Is that still the case here? It, did kindred like get a buff from this? Uh, nah, not really. People are oh, still really contesting this mark. Mm, and I mean, you're still coin flipping most of the time as Kindred, right? Like, you're not clearing fast enough to see where the mark is and get over there unless you have Pryo in, like, every lane. Mm -hmm. And then a follow-up question. People are just going to let you have it, is what I'm saying. It's not that useless. Yeah. Do you think... No, I, I do think they went too far, though. Like, if that 80% reduced was, like, 50% reduced, I think it would feel like it was still relevant and also not too relevant, but 80% reduced just feels too far. Now, do you think, like, top laners or junglers will rotate to grab Scuttle for Scuttle because of they this? They shouldn't. No? Is it not worth the gold value? No, because uh, you get reduced yeah. gold value and the XP is nothing. It takes so long to take it. Mm, good point, good point. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think you're going to see people, like, five-manning scuttle crabs, but you might see, like, a support roam up if they have prior. Anything more than that is just excessive, because it's basically 80 gold. I mean, you get more value out of stealing raptors or krugs 
Um, ironically, support, however, like any bit of gold, any bit of gold and free XP is amazing for a support. So it's like. Not going to lie, I'm pretty sure if a bot lane roams up to take this and they miss like two melees, they're actually losing lane. <laughs> like, I, think they get, I think that they miss more XP and then they just go down a level. <laughs> Unironically, that's how little it gives. Yeah. Again, like, if your AD carry's doing it, that's probably terrible. But, like, if the, if the lane's clear, no one's going to get it. Okay, the support, support is going to literally miss, like, three waves to take this, though. What do you mean? <laughs> this only affects the first scuttle, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's only the first scuttle. But, like, even so. Like, you had times before where a bot lane would, like, push up, uh, like, they'd clear, their top lane is clearing the top side, so they'd go take the bot scuttle, and the team would wind up two scuttles uh, versus none uh, as net. But now that's just not viable. Like, uh, the bot lane just loses too much for it. The XP isn't there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, this is the one change where, like, I, I would prefer the first scuttle just be worth the full amount and spawn at, like, five or six minutes. Like, just, just move it later if you want it later. If you're trying to stop junglers from hitting level four or level five in the first five minutes of the game, just, you know, put the scuttle later. It's super weird to have it worth different amounts at different points of the game. Well, it's also weird because it used to be later. Yeah. And they moved it up, and now they're, like, now they don't like where it's at. So instead of just reverting what they did, they're like, no, we have to change it more. I think they Sorry. like the ability to, like, give the early vision coverage of the river, but I don't see that as being Not so gonna lie, important. feels like yeah. a bait. Like, yeah, most of the time, scuttle vision feels like it does nothing. Yeah, I agree. The sheer number of times I've seen champions just skirt around the edges of scuttle vision. No, the, the only thing the scuttle crab thing even does early is it gives your mid lane move speed if they're roaming. But if they're roaming at, like, level 4, they have to be, like, hard winning lane already. It's such a weird roam time. Mm-hmm. Well, There's for junglers, very few champions that can realistically do that. The one thing I'd say is for junglers, it makes it more inconvenient to cross from like mid side to bot side because you have to walk a different way. So I don't know. It's a little annoying, but I, I mostly agree that it's kind of like scuttle crab now. First scuttle is kind of a bait. It's just like doing the laundry. Like you have to do it if you ever want to have a decent scuttle on the map. But yeah, <laughs> I, I agree. Like, could, it's it's a bait. Could you imagine a game where just no one takes the first scuttle? <laughs> Dude, I've had games where the first scuttle stays up. I've had games where both scuttles don't die until like 6.30. Nobody wants to do it. Oh my god. Especially gosh. when ganking junglers. It's just such a pain. I, yeah. I was playing a Zed jungle game last night. We had a first scuttle bot side there until 11 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> like, nobody bothered. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Crazy. Okay, it what we even... need to do this year then just with this as long as it changes up let's, let's just track this throughout seal and see <laughs> it just have an award longest lived scuttle <laughs> yeah. how, how many minutes can the baby does the baby scuttle need to live before it grows up <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be an interesting mechanic actually i wish it did grow up but if it like it like because it doesn't it's just funny just to see it alive <laughs> That actually be kind of wild if it like grew up at like three forty five or four, so slow and clear junglers could actually catch up or something. Mm -hmm. It gives the idea of this like staged growth scruttle. You have like the baby scruttle, the adult scruttle, scuttle, and then just this giant giga scuttle yeah. at like fifteen minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just Harold at twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lord. It so... molds and creates like shells as terrain across the river. That's gonna be the new dragon. We should stop giving right. <laughs> yeah, stop giving right ideas. They're gonna take this and carry oh, it away. No. <laughs> Dude, next season there's gonna be a chemtech scuttle. <laughs> oh no! no just like squirt the whole the the entire river, river is just camouflage. <laughs> no, it'll be worse. It'll just like randomly squirt out like a patch of camouflage fog as it moves oh along. God. Every time it dashes, it leaves behind a trail. <laughs> Okay, next uh, topic. Yeah, enough, let's go. Let's enough. get out of the scuttle crab here. So we were talking like a little bit about all these like meta changes and all these different things while we were discussing the other topics as well. What are you expecting? We saw like we talked a little bit of a top side saying like a weak side top laners making the scene here because of teleport changes. What do you think are going to be the next big meta changes, whether it be top, mid, bot? What do you think we're going to be seeing a lot of? Like, what, what do you think, the, what do we think the meta will be, like, next patch? Or, like, what is the meta now, and how will it evolve? 
I think. Uh, what are you looking for? We're gonna be looking for like probably uh, next patch. I would imagine because the next patch is gonna be happening slowly. I th when is the next patch actually? I think tonight. it's. <laughs> is it tonight? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's tonight. So we're, we're yeah we're we're seeing we're seeing like TK Tom Kench got a buff. I'm not sure if it's enough to unbench him. I think he's probably still staying on the bench. No, but he's fine. Tom he's uh, he's I, really strong actually. It's kind of gross. He's one of the I think it's top tier though. Top laners honestly. Like, yeah, no, you, I mean he's getting nerfed pretty hard for top, and I don't think the support buffs do anything. He's so like, he's actually getting kind of gutted. He's like, it, like the, makes him better at saving his allies because it doesn't cuck him if he. Eats an ally to save them. I mean, yeah, it yeah. gives him move speed if he eats someone now, but like, yeah, it really still good. doesn't feel like it's up enough to matter. And if it is up enough to matter, then why the hell did we re rework Tom Kench to just make him the same Tom Kench like a year later? It, it feels so random. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's terrible, yeah. terrible change. I think to really the only benefit that TK in particular brings is the it's the Shen benefit, right? Semi global, he can somewhat get around teleport issues. I think he's really a great tank killer. I think like when you see him in solo queue, like whenever I see him, it's because I've saw Nasus or an Orin, and I'm like, all right, I'm bringing out Tom Kench, and then they're just screwed for the rest of the game because there's nothing they can do because Tom Kench has such a oppressive lane style, and he's such a lane bully that he can just kind of um, punish everyone and also, like you said, move around in a faster um, and more aggressive uh, top style that we see with other tanks. I don't think the changes were anywhere near enough of what he needed to make him a support. I think he just got nerfed in top lane. That's honestly. exactly what I think. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, what, as long as his ult is still 120 seconds, when his W used to be 20, like, dude, he's not. <laughs> he wasn't. He wasn't even picked that much when he was quote unquote problematic. Like in certain comps, yeah, sure, he was really you know a big deal, but. He wasn't, like, first pick Bannon Pro. He wasn't played that frequently. Only, like, three supports even played him internationally, you know, relatively often. And that was with a cooldown on his ult. It was literally six times shorter, and that being his only truly val valuable ability. And, I mean, it's not even a meta that, like, he's useful in right now. It's, like, Control Mage Poke meta. Yeah. So why would you ever pick Top Gens as a support to stop your like your ADC from getting one shot when there's like no way you're ever going to be expecting him to anyway? Like unless he just face checks the control mage and gets one tap from 500 range, he's never getting like popped like that. Mm -hmm. Or at least so he what I'm hearing be. is Tom Kench useless above iron. <laughs> because we all have seen the iron tier AD carry who absolutely will face check the mage. I think mean, really there's good no Tom's... helping that then, man. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, help, please. <laughs> it's painful uh, down here. We were just... Well, I think the gray health thing will nerf him in top in the average case. I think really good Tom OTPs will still play him top, and, you know, they'll probably lose like 1% win rate or something. I don't think it's that big a nerf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other, I think mildly interesting thing i've seen come up and i think this really won't i mean i don't know they don't look that effective to me are the janna changes which are like i mean okay Jana changes we've seen this before it did nothing except for that one weird like period where they made reckless play Janna, but we're not we don't want to remember that year <laughs> Janna has the same issue tom Kench has where these buffs like in a different meta maybe are enough to make you relevant as a support. The issue is the, like the stuff that Janna is good into isn't getting played. Like no one is playing stuff that Janna is good against other than I guess like Diana Yasuo. Uh, otherwise this champion just doesn't do anything against Corky or Victor or anyone else who's playing from like 2k range and one-shotting you. Like what's Janna actually doing against that? Absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. I think she's overshadowed by Lulu, too. Yeah, which Lulu is getting her W nerfed. Now, I, mean, I don't it's think like that's nothing. enough. You're not matter. using W off cooldown anyway as Lulu. Yeah. yeah. Like, if that were a, ner a cooldown nerf to shield, I would be a lot more concerned as Lulu. As Lulu main. Because... I mean, they should just be, like, nerfing the R health or the E shield amount, not, like, the cooldown on W. It's a very random thing to nerf. Mm -hmm. okay. Nocturne... Nocturne's getting buffs because Axiom Arc isn't broken on him anymore. Cool, I guess. <laughs> yeah, like, that's kind of a thing. 
I'm I not even sure what to think either. about Kiana. I don't touch this champion, and it just looks like... Like, what? They look like Kiana they're nerfs. Like, that's all I can say on that one. They're nerfs, I guess. I mean, a half second less on the trail. Mm -hmm. And slightly... Like, okay, not slightly. It's fairly significantly less health, base health regeneration, but is that really even going to be enough to stop her if she's good, right? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the most annoying thing about Kiana is definitely the brush interaction, because it feels almost permanent, and I'm glad that they're nerfing that, but only 0.5 seconds, I don't know if that's enough to really make that interaction feel better. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, I don't have strong feelings there. So we were discussing also a little bit about like mid lane, and you guys were saying because we're talking about Kiana and everything, we we're saying Corky needs to be nerfed, and we didn't. Did he get touched the for the next patch? Nope. I don't think so. Nope. So, no touches to Corky. Is, they, uh, oh, they touch hey, practically every champion, but Corky. Do you guys? Riot, Riot operates on a two patch scale, so they hadn't seen Corky just turbo kill everyone in pro and then get picked a million times in solo queue until this patch next patch you'll get nerfed yeah you, so right now are you saying corky should be pick or ban kind of worthy yes yeah. Cor yeah corky victor are base basically you either uh trade them or you ban them uh, like you never let one team get one without you getting the other mm -hmm. victor is like has a good lane matchup into corky but corky's probably better as like just an all-around pick now for like tips for other people like what would you do if corky's picked up is there something you can play is there something you can do to stop it i mean Watch. leblanc has a good matchup into corky and she's fringe meta but you need to coordinate with your jungle to actually abuse leblanc otherwise you get outscaled mm -hmm. yeah. i would argue i think the best way to deal with corky is by also having a lot of pro so i think like the caitlin locks thing is a really good luck maybe diddly in the jungle I mean, um, the issue with that is that Corky out pokes all of those champions by himself. <laughs> like, his R damage is actually just higher than all of you hitting stuff, unless you get Lux bound in one shot. And Corky's also adaptable, is part of the thing. Like, I'm just, like, so far we've just been talking about the one shot you Luden's tier, uh, like, poke Corky, but he also can just build Shield Bow if you try and jump on him. So he's just adaptable in that way. He has several builds. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have that many bad matchups that, like, really abuse him. So right. it, it, he's just a bit problematic. Yeah, because you can't... The problem with Corky in the current meta, too, is, like, with the meta being so centered around never fight, like, only farm and then fight for dragon every five minutes, Corky has package in every fight if he times it for dragons. And so you can't engage on him either. Like, he can always disengage. The package is a, like, 1,200 range dash. It's the longest dash in the game. Mm -hmm. That's not targeted. So what I'm hearing is it's going to come down to, like, jungle picks, and we we're talking about the more, like, Bruiser X-like junglers, like uh, Diego, Vi, I think, uh, and as well as... Uh, what were the other ones we were... Diana. Diana trying to just go in really fast, listen. Um, will that be a... Uh, change in the meta like is that going to be do like is that sort of like the do or die pick when quirky's picked up i mean i don't know if i'd call it a change in the meta that's kind of what people were playing already mm -hmm. just keep playing it you just need to pick a mid lane that can enable them to kind of just do do on the quirky's day like you just can't give quirky a free lane if, if you give quirky or victor a free lane like both of them will just run away with a game even if you're up a lot of gold they hit two items and they can just one shot anyone on the map with first strike mm -hmm. they, they're just way too strong with that keystone I, I think that that's probably the angle that riot needs to take is like nerfing first strike mm -hmm. but even then victor is strong without it because he goes airy into quirky and just bullies it in lane so it's it's awkward mm -hmm. there's like too many ways that these champions are too good yeah so we've talked about our top lane, we talked about jungle, we talked about mid lane, we talked about support. The only one we haven't talked about yet is the ADC. How do you think the ADC meta has changed due to these recent changes here? It really hasn't. Nothing? <laughs> I, I mean, you have hypers getting more relevant, but they're already kind of more relevant at Worlds and a bit on the come up. Jin is still here because he's good into hypers. Uh, Ziggs is still Caitlin. fringe here because he's she like he's good into hypers. The only thing that's really new is Caitlyn, and even then she 
she's not as good as a lot of the hypers. She's just good in lane into them. So mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's pretty stale, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the the biggest problem with bot lane right now is because they're like threatened so little early game. You're getting summoners that are really toxic on ADC characters. Like they're always able to take exhaust or cleanse now. They don't have to take heal almost ever. And the result is that you can't really, I don't know, you, you can't do much against them mid late. I've noticed that ADCs have been in a little bit of a uh, problematic state where you just run into a 0, 7, 0 brand and still die. Should something change in the near future for ADCs? Do you think they need a buff? So the thing with ADC right now is that <laughs> the, the most problematic thing is that the ADCs with the highest win rates are the ones that have AP scalings and can build crowns so they don't instantly die. Which is... <laughs> it's so sad that that's where we're at right now. Where the best way to play ADC is to pick one that's not, not even like fully an ADC and pretend they're a mage while still doing physical damage. It's like, what is this, man? Why is this the state we're in? Yeah. And I do think like Riot's trying to address it. Like They're buffing Senna, they're buffing Samira... They're trying to get oh, more ADCs like, like, to be relevant, but they, I don't know, man. I think you just need to fix the items. The items are so bad. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing is the problem with AD carries is the problem that it's, it's the same problem that's been with AD carries basically since the creation of AD carries items. <laughs> that's fair. Because the, the champions themselves are almost never terrible in terms of concept or execution because it's kind of hard to mess up. I right click, right? It's hard to mess that up. Outside of a few notable exceptions, it's just when they come up, when their items are strong, they're oppressively so, and when their items are not strong or their items are in a weird place, you get 2019. Yeah, I mean, another issue that's always existed for AD carries, it's like, okay, you want to have assassins in the game or mages who can one-shot, right? Well, they presumably those characters also have to be able to one shot their opponent in mid to truly be an assassin, like at least in certain cases, right? The issue is that mid laners who are level six trying to one shot each other are one to two levels higher than the ADC in bot lane. And then ADCs also tend to have lower base HP. So not only do they have lower base HP, but they've gotten less skill HP because they're the lowest level in the game in a lot of cases for the first 10 minutes other than support. Mm -hmm. So. I, I don't know. I think they may need to do something to address ADC XP at some point because early game levels are worth so much gold and ADCs also come online the latest because just their design philosophy of ADC is that they should scale with you know two or three items rather than get a mythic and be online. Yeah, they're, they're, they're designed to be the last resort backup. We are now in the late game. Here is our damage source. Mm-hmm. As compared to the general tendency towards hard snowballing that at least was at least previously was basically baked into every other lane. Yeah, and do you think that snow like hard snowballing is more like happening more often now with the new changes or less often now? I think less than last season, just because there's a, at least an anti snowball mechanic in the game. It's better than just shutting down a champion. Yeah, the, yeah, the fifty-two minute LEC game I saw last week tells what? me. Well, <laughs> oh my god! I don't think that was at all to do with objective bounties. That, no, was, that was all just, on the players, man. That, that was, was <laughs> trash. But like, I, I think like the thing is like it's fifty-two minutes, and that one's unusual. But almost every other game we're seeing is now going beyond you know the thirty-minute mark easily, which like with a few exceptions, and it's like. Okay, does this mean that snowballing is bad, or does this mean that just, you know... I mean, it just means you can't TP to tower and insta win the game at three minutes. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. like I, I don't think that it's that snowballing is bad, it's just the snowball starts later because you can't have a guaranteed play that accelerates you 800 gold at three minutes. Mm -hmm. Like, you're still definitely seeing teams that are winning win, but, you know, it just takes them a bit longer because the start of that is later nice and uh just as like some final f like uh thoughts here how do you guys think these uh, meta changes are gonna ex like uh, change for seal like you guys been in seal for uh quite a long time and do you think that players are going to be picking up very certain characters what do you think is going to be like the most picked character this season 
Should be uh, quirky. Yeah. Should be quirky. <laughs> yeah. If we're talking objectively based on numbers, it ought to be. It's probably going to be quirky. Now, mm-hmm. considering that this is steel, and as such, I have there is a disturbing trend, especially the especially in the lower divisions, to kind of just take, acknowledge the meta exists and then completely ignore it. Mm-hmm. I have no clue. As a caster, I'm terrified because like we're either going to get games that are, you know, zero to 103 seconds absolute bangers, or we're going to be falling asleep at the casting desk. <laughs> you know, I noticed a trend that at least in the past seasons that a lot of our support players like artillery mages. I would predict Lux is going to be super contended because she's really she's the best artillery mage right now and is actually really good in general. Not just because you like her or are comfortable. I think locks will be really common. Mm-hmm. All righty. Uh, any final uh, thoughts from anyone for any meta changes? Any la- last takeaways here? All righty. Uh-huh. Um, for the love of God, buff Scuttle again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Buff Scuttle or give us the Chemtech Scuttle Riot. Nice. <laughs> I'm on board I, I do not need more chemtech in my life. <laughs> a dragon you know, effect if you scuttle remove crab. the chemtech dragon, I will allow you chemtech scuttle. Trade offer. <laughs> Trade offer. <laughs> Trade. Do you want to chemtech, chemtech scuttle if you remove the fog? Yeah. Uh, I'll just right. make it like a little damage trail or something. <laughs> it leaves around the river. Oh my god. Or, you know what? You can keep camouflage even just make it like a zone that moves instead of the entire thing mm-hmm. like just have it be like one fog puddle that just floats around in a sort light of invisibility yeah like spotlight <laughs> of invisibility or something. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't need to be the whole jungle why is it the whole jungle no other rim is the entire jungle it's just <laughs> that one you really trust riot to make terrain that moves I trust Riot to make decisions now so they can make more decisions later. <laughs> hey man, they're keeping their devs employed, right? I, exactly. I trust Riot... Like, okay, no, I don't trust Riot to make train that moves. I do trust Riot to make train that sing the banger song, though. That is something that they can do. <laughs> do right, that, just Riot. Just literally use this... Just use Senna E. Like, is it that hard? <laughs> I mean, have you seen Minion Pathing? <laughs> true facts Alrighty, guys thank you all for joining me today uh just the great great discussion can't wait to talk to you guys more about this in the future uh thank you for everyone coming into the chat and uh letting up a storm here i do have a special presentation for all of you we're trying something new we actually have a pre-recording of karen franz and cage the reaper in our last uh, community day exhibition match so I will be uh, testing this out, playing it out for you guys. We will be doing that in just a couple moments. And uh, once again, thank you guys so much. Any uh, final takeaways, guys? Anything you want to say to the community here? Uh, just from my, from my standpoint on this one, going in mostly for casting this year and not really playing, I'm just looking forward to seeing some, like I said, absolute bangers. We are fairly consistent at putting those out, so I'm hoping that we actually we get to see some crazy stuff this year. This uh, well, not this, the, both this year and this season, and that uh, y'all can just step it up, bring the entertainment. I'm here to yell hype stuff at you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and die on my my hill of uh, objective bounties. I want to see the best comebacks of all time. <laughs> oh, then just go back and watch uh, season. For Sharima finals. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking um, of uh, Sharima finals, I'm looking forward to showing Ansem that he's a jabber and uh, you know just beating him. <laughs> you guys are gonna have to get through Karen France first. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know he's a jabber too. He's a jabber. <laughs> Karen France has to win. <laughs> oh. I love it. I love this. Alrighty, guys. Thank you all. I'm going to quickly get everything set up for you. And I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.
Good afternoon, everybody. How's it going? My name is Karen Friends. Joining me today is Cage Reaper. We'll be your casters for today. We have a special exhibition match between two teams. Cage, take it away. Howdy, y'all. It's going to be a good time in here today. We got Return of the Middle Sticks featuring Oath in the top line, the Shade Slayer in the jungle, Tall X Guy in mid lane, Aeropox and Maristomatic round out the bot lane. On the other side, gooning it all the way through, we've got Adam Don't Miss in top lane, Double Shank in the jungle, Redemption 91 mid lane, for Sparta and Wary 98 holding it down in the bot lane. Alrighty, we're going to go ahead and take it on into picks and bands so we can take a look and see what the teams have drafted for this. So on the blue side, we have a Yone, Thresh, Kaiza, Diana, and Set coming up against Goon Squad on the right-hand side for with Ezreal, Lulu, Vigar, Vi, and Cho'Gath. So let's go through and take a, you know, discuss a little bit about what these team comps are, what we think they're going to be trying to do, and what do you think? Uh, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this develops. A lot of times in SEAL, we have these more established matchups, people who know each other, people who have played against each other, and so there's a little bit of... Uh, targeted banning going on i think right now on the surface of it you've got a really really scary wombo combo from return of the middle sticks although there is no middle sticks so i think that they're liars yes presently uh, wasn't even banned out from them so that's a bit odd that they didn't you know live up to their name maybe in game two yeah we'll see one can only hope uh the bands coming in against them leblanc victor nico all mid lane focused the nico's got to be a pocket pick because LeBlanc and Victor are just overtuned at the moment. Uh, going the other way, you've got an Ivern ban, which is a little odd. Must be a specific ban. And then Darius Mordekaiser trying to keep Adam Don't Miss off of those strong fighters. So he defaults back to the tank. Uh, just kind of running down the line on matchups. Yeah, what's I really interesting, we saw five the first five bands in this game were all junglers, so there's definitely a lot of priority placed on that role between the two teams. They have to be thinking that that is their win condition on both sides. Oh, definitely. Well, you can see what happened. After, after the first round of picks and the Ivern ban, both junglers hadn't picked, and you've got Graves, Zinn, Viego, and Lee Sin as the final four bands of the game directly into two jungle pickups so it, it'll be interesting to see if somebody picks up a jungler earlier on in the next round uh especially because it doesn't look like a whole lot of diversity from these picks they're all fighter ad picks and so um i'm, I'm a little disappointed in that that approach but we'll see if it works out for them um i just want to run down these lane matchups real quick i mm -hmm. think set chogoth you've got to favor the set there that's just waiting for a ticking time bomb. Cho'Goth and Nisset, I think, is a really rough lane for Cho'Goth, and he never kind of gets on his feet. Yeah, Cho doesn't really have the ability to whittle down Set through his passive healing. Um, the only real way that I see it going in favor of the Cho'Gath is through maybe a jungle gank with the Vi, lock him down, and then just silence him long enough that he can't use his Haymaker shield uh, so that Cho'Gath can get that execute with his ultimate. Yeah, I, I, that's the only opportunity but then you've also got the problem of team fight synergy and mm -hmm. a chugoth landing in the middle of your team is not good for anybody no oh, no absolutely not um continuing down the line one-on-one -on -one, i think diana probably loses to vi if she's behind if they're even but if diana's a little bit ahead i don't know that the vi wins that in the mid lane you've just got a bad matchup um i i don't necessarily think that Vigar can win this one unless he gets really, really ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and bot lane's a fiesta, so that'll just be a matter of who gets caught. Both are strong lanes. Uh, I don't necessarily know about the Ezreal-Lulu synergy. That seems a little bit odd. I normally think of Lulu with your traditional hyper carries. Yeah, and looking at the roster, I don't really see much of a hyper carry. I mean, you obviously have Vigar's infinite skill in late game, but is that really worth the Lulu babysit? I, I don't think so, and that that to me is the biggest question mark about these two pick these two drafts. Like uh, looking at the pick and ban, uh, Chogoth was the final pick. Mm -hmm. They picked Chogoth in the set, which is a little questionable to me. And they picked Lulu early on, but then they didn't pick anything for the Lulu to stick to. Um, 
So yeah. we'll we'll see how this works out for them. I think that my initial feeling going into the game is the wombo combo of the set ult Diana and Yon ultis coming through is mm -hmm. going to work a lot better than the pick and destroy single target approach from Goon Squad. Yeah, we'll have to see. All right. Well, I think we're about ready to head into game. So let me get that set up and we'll take it from there. Let's do it. Okay, and we are here. Reaper, are you ready to unpause? Yes, sir. Alrighty, we're going to unpause in three, two, one. Unpause. Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, so we have game one, and again, on the blue team, we have Revenge of the Middle Sticks facing off against, on the red team, Goon Squad. Welcome to Summoner's Rift. And it's looking like a chapter. pretty traditional five point from both teams. Uh, a little bit of an odd positioning by the bottom lane of Goon Squad. Just with the uh, the ward drop and recall by Vi, nobody hanging in the mid lane. But other than that, a pretty traditional start from both teams. Just spreading out, making sure nothing funky is going to happen early. Yeah, it doesn't look like anything that sighting will happen in the first 55 seconds, minute 30 of this. Vi, yep, red trinket, as you said. Otherwise, all standard. Minions yeah, I'm spell. actually surprised Diana went blue trinket. I play a decent amount of jungle Diana myself. I feel like the you red trinket... Yellow? Generally the play um, on most fighters. So it, it doesn't surprise me as much from the Vi, although Vi is the, one of the few fighters I take blue on. So I, I'm, I'm surprised at the, uh, the jungle itemization. Everything else seems about what I would expect looking up and down the line. Yeah, I think that's fair. Well, what do you think early game, what kind of action do you think we're going to see? Where should people be making the plays? Well, Diana's a power farmer by nature. She can gank decently uh, at level 3-ish. Her power is there to make a play. But she doesn't do great until level 6. Her main priority is going to be jungle clear. Um, right now, it looks like both junglers on a pretty traditional clear. Uh, I think that bot lane is probably just going to look to stall out. The place we might see action is going to be in top or mid lane, I would guess. I'm going to expect the Yon to be looking to make a play, and here we go. He goes yeah. in for a little trade, but winds up just taking a turret shot for his troubles. Yeah, I had a little bit of action top lane as well, but nothing major. Both of them are pretty much just going to use their passives to heal on up. Uh, and both of them went that Doran shield, so... You know, neither of them are looking for something big Oh, hang now. on a second. We got a hook down bot lane. Thresh is in on the Lulu at night. Let's go down on both supports. We have first blood in for the Kaiza. Pushing off the Ezreal. Flashes were burned on uh, both summoner, or both uh, supports, I believe. Oh, nope, only the Thresh. Lulu knew better than to waste her flash. She was dead there anyways. So very good Thresh hook by Meristomatic. He was able to force that. Another hook went out, but Ezreal got away. That's not where I expected that to go down, but I suppose anytime you're playing that enchanter into a hooking champion, you can be in a little bit of trouble if you set wrong. Oh, yeah. And we got a very aggressive set right now. He actually moved just a little bit too far to get that uh, stun with his E. Uh, the mini was just out of range of it. So while the trade still went ultimately in his favor, uh, it wasn't as good as it could have been. You know, it was still very close between the two. Interesting point here. Both junglers are ignoring that. Uh, Vi that might be coming yeah. top, or yep, she's coming top. We have Vi coming in on the set right now. He's pretty pushed up, and he just uses E. Doesn't have it. Got the knock up. Here comes Vi's dodge. She hit him up. Haymaker coming out, but looks like uh, Cho'Gath is going to get out. Oath, meanwhile, ooh, does oh. not survive. Doesn't Good pick up donation. the kill. Good donation from Double Shanks there to give it over to her top laner, knowing that he's in a subpar matchup. But the invade coming through the jungle, you've got Taga jumping over the wall. They found Double Shank. Yep, forcing him out. Gonna be able to take his uh, camps if they so want it. They've got the priority. Though surprisingly, Vigar, you know, Redemption hasn't come up yet. It would be a 2v3 if they did so. Vi's re-engaged on them. Gid Slayer's low, has to burn the flash, get out. Alrighty. A lot of action in the first, you know, two, three minutes of the game. 
That was a whole lot of greed about a whole little bit of nothing. Mm-hmm. Baby Cage out from Viger, a little bit of poke, but nothing more gonna happen there. Meanwhile, Vi did get her Krugs after all of that. Very ballsy by uh, Revenge of the Middle, Sk Middle Sticks to be going in for, you know, the Krugs when it's a 2v3, potentially. Notably and concernedly about that entire trade is, while there was losses in that trade for the Vi, she lost the big Krug amongst a couple of little other things, mm -hmm. Flash burned on Gid for that entire situation. It didn't result in the killer really much other than 32 gold. Yeah, but that's very true. Vi looking for something here mid. Baby Cage comes down. That's a little early if you want to set something up. Yep, tall guy just there. Took a bit of poke. You know, he is fairly low, but he's not in any real danger for the moment. Plus, he's got Diana right around the corner, ready to help out if needed. Oh, Diana and uh, Vi might meet, though. Maybe. Oh, right, there's the flash engaged. She managed to hit some damage. Exhaust went down. He's still alive. And Tall Guy picks up the kill with the exhaust and the tower damage coming in clutch. What a good fucking play. That exhaust, oh. though. That was a beautiful exhaust. Thresher's are looking to make a move there, but Hex Flash doesn't quite work. Yeah, beautiful exhaust mid lane. That was really well played by Tall Guy. Almost baiting it in on double shank. And good awareness by Shade Slayer moving down, popping over the wall to take that dragon, knowing that the Vi's flash is down, the Vi's dead. Diana actually takes dragon really fast, um, loses most of her health doing it, but it's, uh, it's a pretty quick take regardless. Yep, and they don't have any vision in that area, I don't think so. Looks like because she was able to go over the wall, you know, she's just going to be able to get that for free. Scuttle not going to catch her out. Yep, there it is. TP in mid lane from Vigar. Oh, we got another hook from the Thresh down bot lane. There goes the Flash, and Knight is out. As for, Kaiser trying to put down some more damage. Might not have enough. Yep, she has to back off there, takes the Lantern, and gets out. Meanwhile, mid lane, a little bit more of action there, but the Baby Cage is able to discourage any further shenanigans from Yon. Very good. See, that's the benefit of uh, Wary's decision earlier on during that first engage, not to burn her Flash there. She knew she was dead at that moment in time. By saving it, she was able to get out the second time when she got hooked. Yeah, it, it's always really important, and it's something that's overlooked a lot of the time when people... Every now and again, you just gotta accept that you're dead, mm -hmm. and you're better off holding your flash for a later engage, or a later bailout that you have a better probability of getting out of. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, notably, despite the fact that there's only a one-kill gap right now, there's a 20 CS gap in both solo lanes with Set and Yon significantly up on their counterparts. It's making it almost a 1k gold lead mm -hmm. as the Thresh wanders into Vi's topside jungle. Yeah, Thresh out there, kind of catching out the Vi in vision, really just trying to help his jungler, you know, figure out where the opposing jungler is so they can consider paths and ganking opportunities. Vi looks like she's going to come top. She did walk over to Ward, Set, mm. Okay, she stopped to clear the ward, so Seth's just kind of up there. He's got Diana to help him out. I think they win in the 2v2 since everybody has alts available. Except for uh, Vi still 5. Both junglers are 5. But yeah, Yon I think Seth ult wins. Yon finds this Vi out again. Tall X guy really putting the pressure down. Okay. Vi gets it away. Yep, meanwhile, top lane, we also have some more damage going out there as they're fighting to get priority. Yon ulting underneath the tower, putting down a lot of damage on the Vi. He's able to get out, but he takes the last tower shot. Meanwhile, Cho'Gath burned Flash to try and close the distance. Diana's still level 5. It's dangerous, but Cho is out of mana. Seth's trying to come on in. Diana's putting down some good damage. He doesn't have the damage, uh, the mana to ult. There's the set ultimate. Beautiful work. Nice response out of uh, Return of the Middle Sticks. Yeah, really good collapse there. A little bit of overaggression a couple of times, but their team bailed him out for it. Originally, you gotta think as the Vi that you'll take that trade dying under your turret to have Yon lose out on as much as he did. Yep, meanwhile, Thresh but, get in on the Ezreal. He does ultimate their E away, but Kaiser goes in. We also have a fight going on top lane. Gid Slayer overstayed a little bit. He went down. Atra, or who am I saying? Thresh is the only survivor on blue in bot lane. Meanwhile, we still have four Sparta and Ezreal alive down there. 
So they traded support for ADC. I think well, that might have been a shutdown. It was two kills at that point. Uh, no, I mean, I there was so. a, a bunch of scrapping that went down. Mm -hmm. And you had Kaisa dropping for Lulu in the bot lane. You had Vi catching the overstay Diana. But unfortunately, even with the kills kind of evening out across the board and all those trades, Return of the Middle Sticks is still slowly creeping ahead in that CS number, and their lead has grown. Yep, we have just under a death per minute in the game right now, so a lot has happened here. Chose a little bit overextended right now, but nope, Seth's stopping to take the ward. Doesn't have his ult up anyway, so he should just be able to walk out. Marismatic on that roam again, looking to make something happen on the top side of the map, but there's just nothing going at the moment. Yep, and despite Mercedes roaming, like, his Kaiser has not fallen behind at all in CS. She still has a little bit of a lead. It's not as much as it was before, but it's still there. Meanwhile, top lane, we do have a good fight going out. Ooh, Set might want to take this all the way. We did get the knockup. He's trying to walk away. Does he have the follow-up? He doesn't have flash. His ult is just about to come back up. Does he want to take it? He is in, and he gets the knockup. Meanwhile, bot lane, we had a roam come down from Tall Guy. Aeropox is hit by the Ezreal ult, but there's the burst damage on the tall guy. Able to finish him off. Vi is here. Thresh is here. Does he land the hook? Oh, they pick up the Lulu, and the hook was on the Vi, bringing her back in. She has to burn Flash to get out. Very well played. Beautiful fight. Yeah, that's kind of the, the backbreaker there for the Goon Squad. They've got fights going down all across. Viger's just trying to farm up and get relevant, but they're losing fights on both sides of the map right now, on both side lanes, and the lead's just ballooning out of control against them at the moment. Right now, we got about a, just about 4k lead, lead brewing here at 11 minutes. That is a pretty sizable early game lead, but let's not forget... Oh, hang on a second, Vi is down here. She knows that they're down there. She's got Vigar and her bot lane collapsing, so as long as she can keep them there. Meanwhile, top lane set is fighting with him, but he's got a 2v2. All right, they managed to pick that up. Oh. Yes, it does. Meanwhile, bot lane, they did pick up the Kaiza. We do have a response coming in from Tall Guy. He's in there. I don't think he quite wants that. It is 4v2. Trying to pick up this dragon. Lost off stage. We uh, we had the Cho'Gav dropping in the top lane. Well, there's the steal attempt. He puts down some damage. It's not quite enough. It isn't able to to steal it, so that is second drag over to a goon squad. But Return of the Middle Sticks content here just to trade for that Rift Herald. They've still got a minute and a half to get those plates from it. You gotta imagine it's gonna help them crack this middle turret. Yeah, absolutely. And as I was trying to say before everything uh, went down there, that was quite a lot on both sides of the map. Uh, you get to remember now with the patch, uh, we do have the, the bounties, so there are definitely comeback mechanics in this game. Uh, meanwhile, we have a fight broken out mid lane. They dropped the Herald. A lot of damage traded down, but we are able to trade double shank. Vi goes, does go down with Tall Guy with that tower helping them out with the damage. Yeah, the, those Yon ultis, they're getting the kills, but you got to imagine that you don't want to keep diving under turrets with your ulti and die, and it's not going to be the best maneuver, especially when you're giving Vagar all the free farm that he's getting, but he still is 20 CS down, so, you know, maybe you keep taking those trades if they keep working out. Now, let's take a look real quick, see how Vagar's doing on stacks. Right now, he's up to 59 stacks. Not much of a Vigar player. I'm not sure if that's uh, good at this time or not. But for those of you who are, that's where he's at. Yeah, I couldn't tell you, but worth noting, we've got two Mythics in the game at the moment. The third just came through. That Yone dying to Vi under the turret finished Vi's Sunderer. Well, but... Set's found uh, Vi out. There's no one to respond to really help. Cho'Gath is starting to come down, but meanwhile, Yone and Diana from uh, Blue Team are coming in. Thresh got another hook in bot lane. Ultimate's coming down from Goon Squad bot lane. Uh, Ezreal is trading a lot of damage, but he's ultimately losing back here. Tower is there to save him, but Kaiza ult comes on in, picks up the sneaky double kill. It's going to fall to the tower, though. Oh. Beautiful attempt. It was great to see. Ultimately, just didn't quite have the survivability underneath that tower. Shield was not enough. Wow. Oh, 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 big ulti. Pulling her back. Instantly picked up the 
uh, jungler, no escape for her there. Double shank, unfortunate. Trying to get a little bit of vision in there and was probably taken out. Yeah, there, there's a little bit of uh, Return of the Middle Six right now saying, look, if we trade kills in the right positions, you're losing waves. And it's given them a 6k lead at this Redemption, point. Redemption, no baby cage. He's being forced out. He's trying to get to that blasting cone, flashing away. Didn't really work for him. Thrush took the cone just to make sure there was no escape. Oh. And Redemption finally dies. He's made it. He had made it 14 minutes without dying. So. Oh, right, going that. in on uh, double or on tall guy, trying to stay underneath that tower. Able to still pick up the kill under the tower. Oath had to back off. He'll be fine to walk away now, though. Honestly, well played by uh, Double Shank there to still manage to pick up the the kill in the one v two. Uh, meanwhile, Oath is oh wow, a lot of damage there. He's able to pick up with the Haymaker. Chogath ult not enough to take out Oath. Healing up a little bit uh, from his passive. The yep, Epic Knight though, and the knock up. That's going to be enough to do it. Oh, oh, almost got out there. Right. Comes through, picks up the kill on the Lulu. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a action-packed game. We're coming up uh, 22, what is that, 21? No, my math is so terrible. <laughs> um, 26 kills there uh, in a 15-minute game. We're almost at two kills a minute now. Oh, there's a pick on the Cho'Gath. Not exactly your favorite target to pick, so I think they're just going to, you know, trade some abilities and back up. But Yone might want it. There's the knock-up, able to prevent him. Yep, just backs out. And looking across the board right now, it's an 8-kill gap, which really, if you're doing the math, should only be about 2 or 3k. But we're sitting here looking down at almost a 9k split. Based off of the current state of the map, there's a few towers in favor of Return of the Middle Sticks, but the farm differential in all three carry spots is really hurting them. There's almost a 40 split CS, a 40 split, or a 40 CS split top, a 40 CS split mid, and a 30 CS split ADC. Oh, Yone is on a ward. He's not aware of it, though. Nope, just backs off. Yeah, they, they sensed something was up there. Good job, Kaiser, there, checking it with her W. Oh, yep. just, is this a pick here? Yep, Yomi has no escape. He's going to try and ult away. Uh, is he able to dodge most of the CC out of uh, Vi's ult there um, as he makes his escape? That was a really bizarre interaction between the Yone ult and the Vi ult, and I'm not entirely sure if it stopped Yone from moving the way that he was supposed to. No, I don't think so. It looked to me like he was able to move uh, naturally, but Seth's coming in here. Cho's smart enough. He moves away so that Seth's not able to get the big ult, but he does anyways after the blast kill. Lots of damage going down. There's that wombo combo we were talking about earlier. They pick up all five in very quick succession. That was just an absolute masterpiece by O to manage to dunk the Cho'Goth back on top of his entire team. Yep. Joe initially makes the read to run away from his team, but then moves back into a position and... Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, so Cho went to move down towards that blast cone to get away from his team, but he still took the blast cone, which put him right back into that same position anyways. I'm not sure if that was intentional, um, or if he meant to maneuver a little bit further right so he go over the wall. But regardless, it just gave Oath that perfect uh, Cho'Gath ult right into his entire back line. Meanwhile, oh, he's taking a little bit of a trade there. It's a bit cheeky considering, you know, Seth doesn't have any escapes. Uh, he's fighting four people now, so yeah, I don't think he's going to be able to stay. Yeah, the team is making the call to let him drop, but that was a long time for him to survive. Uh, 1v4-5 for most of that fight. Yeah, the, the set's getting to raid boss levels at this point. We're starting to see second items come through mm -hmm. for Return of the Middle Stakes. Well, we've still got first items and, like, tiny components coming through on the side of Goon Squad. They're going to have to stall this game out or they're in a lot of trouble. Yep. So, I mean, it's 19 minutes. We do have a 11k gold lead in favor of Revenge of the Middle Sticks. Um, 
I don't know, what, if you were Goon Squad, what kind of things would you be trying to do right now to get back into this game? Right now, it's right, yeah, we have a big pick going down. Uh, Yon is able to get out of there. Meanwhile, lots of trading going back and forth. Yon re-engages, is brought down. They did grab a hook onto the Vi. Uh, who received the Lulu ult. Vi is looks like she's going to go out. But in comes Diana, instantly gets polymorphed. So that's two picks going down for uh, Goon Squad. A little yeah. bit of a miscommunication, misengage uh, by Gidge Slayer and Tall Guy, kind of staggering their engages. Um, worked out very well for Goon Squad to kind of catch back up a little bit. Give them the really 2K. Previous question, that. Exactly that is what you have to do. Uh, you're far enough behind at this point that it, it's a steep mountain to climb. Mm. 10K is a death set. Right, and we got right. Set coming in on the side. He's taking a lot of damage. Haymaker coming out, not super effective, but he does get the ult onto Cho'Gath, only really goes down on the buy-in. Meanwhile, they do trade top laners. They did force them off with their mid lane tower, though, prevented that objective bounty. That's pretty huge. I think that's completely worth the trade of your top laners for at one for one. Oh, no. Double shake might be here. Yep. Well, he does have his Q, is able to put some distance in. Yep, they're not going to take the ult, but there's the Kaiser ult. Puts down some damage. Lulu is there. Oh, but not quite enough. Yep, where he knows he doesn't have much HP himself, he needs to get out of there. Yeah, I I was going to agree with you that you take that trade. It, it, you may lose, not gain that turret, but for Goon, at this point, anytime you're going one for one, it, it's in your favor, but the Rift Herald just comes down. Yeah. Forgot that was cooking. Yep, they've been sitting on that for a little while now. Able to secure the Herald. That is mid tower, mid Herald gone. Uh, meanwhile, Diana re engages, puts down some good burst damage, but goes down herself. In comes the Yone on the back line. Cho'Gath goes down to the front line. All in all, was that a three for one in favor of Revenge of the Middle Sticks? You got a teleport coming in from set. There you have this uh, Vi forced off. She's all alone. Is able to ju juke them a little bit. Still gets ulted. Taking a lot of damage. Makes it out of there. Oh, going low. Drops the Haymaker. Disengages. Looks like they're going to try and force down this middle. They might be able to end the game 22 minutes in. Tall guy brought real low. Are they going to continue forcing this? No, they made the call. They're going to back out. Uh, this is a really safe call. I don't know that it's necessary at this point. We do have a uh, teleport coming in mid lane. Vigar's caught Oath. Oh, he just flashes right on through. He's re-engaging to Vigar. Vigar does not have his teammates. Mm, not too sure about that. Well, looking at the scoreboards right now, there's about a 1,000 to a 2,000 gold split across most of the rolls. But... At the beginning of the game, we said that this was going to come down to the solo laners. And looking at the solo lanes, you've got a 4,000 gold lead for the set in favor of the Cho'Gath. Or in favor of the set against the Cho'Gath. And you've got a 5,000 gold lead for the Yone over the Vigar. And looking at those matchups, you got to hope that in the next game, Goon Squad does something a little bit different to not put themselves into such unfavorable lane assignments. Yeah, I think we saw a lot of throughout this game. Yeah, there's Dragon going down for a blue team. No surprise there. A lot of this game, we saw a lot of aggression coming out of Tall Guy. He was making plays, kind of setting the tempo in the mid lane priority there. Um, but meanwhile, you know, both side lanes were just kind of winning in their own positions. Diana did go down to the Ez or Ezra went down to the Diana. They got a pick down there. Meanwhile, she's called out. Tries to drop ult. Gets burned down. Not going to survive that. So ultimately traded one for one jungler for ADC. We're just kind of healing on up. I mean, like like we said earlier, any one for one's good. But I think the other problem, and this is something that we didn't touch on well, is Goon Squad doesn't really have any wave clear. Yeah, I think that's definitely an issue, especially when your Ezreal goes down. You really don't have much. 
Like, Vi can't wave clear without getting in there. Vigar can only kind of baby cage, but that takes away a lot of his defensive opportunity and leaves him vulnerable, as well as his entire team. Meanwhile, Lulu and Chogat don't have a lot. Meanwhile, Lulu did get pitched. In goes the engage from the set. Oh, he's able to put down a lot of damage. Haymaker comes out, takes out the Ezreal. There's the Wombo. The rest of them are just falling. That's going to be game one going over to Revenge of the Middle Sticks. All right, so we talked about how we didn't know a whole lot about both teams going in, and we were going to be interested to see what changes. Do you ban the Yon or do you ban the set? Going into the Nets game, it's a tough call. I think it really kind of depends on your purse. I mean, it's hard to say because we don't know much about Good Squad and what they play, what their rosters look like. Um, on the one hand, if they have personal picks that can answer either of those, that will obviously shape their decision. But not knowing that, I think looking at the performance, set. Well, he was ma massive with his able to ultimate uh, the Cho'Gath and really dominate those team fights. Yon did a lot to set the tempo of the game, and I think that's what you'd have to get rid of. That that's kind of my inclination too. I think that I I'll be interested to see how Return of the Middle Sticks uses their last pick as the teams are going to switch sides, um, because I I think that the the Cho'Gath pick might have been one that should be coached. I, I don't know that you want to pick a Cho'Gath into a set ever, um, especially if you're holding counter pick for your top lane. So I, I want to see Goon Squad bounce back from this with a stronger team comp idea moving forward. For Return of the Middle Sticks, I'm excited to see what they do with last pick this time around. Yeah, I, absolutely. I All right, well, why don't we take about a five-minute break here real quick, uh, and we'll be back with game two. Sounds like a plan. Good afternoon, everybody, and we are back, ready to go into game two. So I'm going to pull up uh, the pro drafts now, get that set up and on your screen. So to go over, once again, on blue side, we have Goon Squad. The teams have switched for game two, in case you're unaware. Um, meanwhile, red side, we have Revenge of the Middle Sticks. So Reaper, take us away. So right off the bat, there must be some heavy, heavy concern about certain champions or one tricks because the first three bands for each team is exactly the same. And after the game that just happened, I would have really expected the Goon now, Squad. Hang on a second there, Reaper. I think that you might have the wrong uh, match history or, or pro draft pulled up. Are your first three bands not Victor, LeBlanc, Nico? Nope. I think that's the same as our last game. Exactly. The... The band change is the Kaisa and Set bands in the second phase. Yes. No. Yes. First phase is Set and Kaisa. First phase is three bands. Oh my God, you are right. I see, ladies and gentlemen, this is why we use Pro Draft for, for our, our drafting phase. Uh, yep. All right, that's my mistake. Sorry about that, Reaper. Please take us away. You're looking at the right thing. I'm just. I'm having a moment. You're good. We're figuring it out. This is why we don't use unsealed branded stuff, guys. <laughs> Officially seal branded pro draft sponsored by Seal. Um, anyways, I of the things that have changed, I do like to see the fact that Goon Squad took the opportunity to ban away a couple of pain points in the Kaisa and especially in the set from last game. Uh, I'm assuming that they might have tried to take a swing at the Yon, but Revenge of the Middle Sticks didn't even give him a chance locking in that Akali pretty early on after the Syndra first pick. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, looking at team comps, I mean, Goon Squad, we have now... I'm a little bit confused about what their lineup looks like. So, I mean, Syndra mid lane, I'm presuming. Vigar should be ADC with Tom, or Tom going top lane and Nami support. Does that look correct to you? I'm gonna guess it's gonna be Syndra ADC. Okay. Um, just based off of that meta from like a year and a half ago when they ran that, um, we saw the Vigar from them in the mid lane last time. I'm gonna guess they're doing it again. 
I don't know if Revenge of the Middle Sticks thought the same thing that you did, and that's why they locked the Akali right after. Mm -hmm. But either way, I I don't think that the Akali Vigar is a bad matchup for Akali. I think that Syndra is a worse matchup for Akali. So in the grand scheme of things, I think Revenge of the Middle Sticks put themselves in a beneficial situation once again where, oh, wait, hold on. Bottom lane. Lux Seraphine? That's my guess. I think their team comp is a little bit, is, you know, a lot more easy to discern looking at this. Lux Seraphine, ba, uh, Viego, mid Akali top, uh, Lisa and Jungle. Uh, probably Viego top against the tank would be my guess. He he has an absurdly long auto attack range, which enables him to abuse tanks kind of the same way Aurelia does. Plus, with his Q passive, he, he cuts through them really really effectively. You don't see a whole lot of him top lane because of his squishiness and exposure. But when he first came out, you saw a lot of him in the top lane to counter tanks, specifically like Tom Pinch. Okay, uh, interesting. I haven't seen a Viego top yet myself, so good to know. Yeah, but the biggest thing that I'm curious about is, does Lux or Seraphine farm? <laughs> That's a good question. Which is support and which is uh, the carry? No, I and guess we'll find out. We'll find out in just a second. Also, the Lee Sin was banned last game, and it comes through this game for Shade Slayer. So it's going to be interesting. Let's see if the Lee Sin ban was worth it last game. All righty. We're going to go ahead and take it live. Alrighty, we are here for game two of Goon Squad facing off against Revenge of the Middle Sticks. Uh, Reaper, are you ready to unpause? Let's do it, sir. All right, we're going to go live in three, two, one. Unpause. Alrighty, so first off, you know, game one, Revenge of the Middle Sticks obviously took a pretty convincing victory there. What are your thoughts on uh, game two? It looks like we do have a five-man infate coming out bot side. They're heading down around through the lane. A little bit of maybe miscommunication. Akali's going through the river while the rest of her team is going down. Shenanigans. Yep. Lisa leading the charge. Yep. Oh, gets the Q on to worry. Slow went down. She has to throw, change out Flash. But I think that's going to be about it. Nami burned Flash, and everybody else is just going to walk away free. Well, for how well that patch almost worked, you got to be feeling pretty lucky as Goon Squad to get away from that, just costing yourself a Flash. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they were able to pretty much walk up on them, but... I think uh, Revenge of the Millsticks had a little bit of a staggered invade there, so people like Lux weren't in position to really get out that binding and lock people down. So they are rewarded. They do get their vision out. Uh, they did obviously get the Nami flash, and she hasn't gone back to heal. Uh, so she is going to be coming to lane, you know, missing about a quarter or so of her HP. And another big thing here is... Double Shank on Vision, clearing his first buff. And so if you are at Revenge of the Middle Sticks now and this Lee Sin, it'll be really interesting to see how Lee Sin pads. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, you know, Revenge of the Middle Sticks does have that knowledge of the pathing rules. They're not really too sure where he is, you know. Obviously, they can kind of guess by the timer of where, you know, when they left the invasion, but they're not sure. So we'll have to see where he ends up popping up for them and what they make of it. Under normal circumstances, I would expect the Lee to be trying to make a play towards the jungle, knowing where the enemy is going to be going in. But I think you run into the problem here of the fact that Zin Zhao is one of the best early duelists in the game, and you can't necessarily invade him. And yeah. so it looks like both junglers are falling back to a, a kind of traditional full clear again. Yeah, but I think that's the safe way to play it. I mean, we do obviously have our very interesting team comps on both sides. Neither team brought an ADC. Um, it does look like it is going to be an AP carry uh, Seraphine instead of the Lux. She has taken all the CS. So, you know, what are your thoughts on uh, this bot lane? It's definitely a unique thing. Um, I have played similar bot lanes to the Seraphine Lux bot lane, 
I think I like it a little bit better than the Nami Syndra. Um, I think Nami, or I think Syndra ADC can work. I don't know if Nami would be my pick with it. Uh, but I, I think that the advantage has to go slightly in favor of the double mages. I think my big thing in this particular matchup is looking at the team comps. There's no tank to take advantage of the all AP, with the exception of Zen Zhao, but almost entirely all AP comp. On the side Zen Zhao of is coming in mid lane here, though. Looks like Vigar's just going to walk away. Yep. Just a little bit of damage. Trade a tower shot. Nothing more. You know, top lane, Tom Kench is happy to be trading damage with Oath. Meanwhile, uh, Zen Zhao is right there, but nope, not going to be able to capitalize on anything. But yeah, as you were saying, though, oh, never mind, because Lee Sin is coming right back under Redemption. Has to burn the flash to get out. That's going to make him a vulnerable target with Gid uh, making repeat appearances to help out Tall Guy, trying to get him rolling again like he did in game one. Interestingly, no blood from the first round of things going on on the map, but there's almost two kills worth of gold split in 600 gold coming down from the farm difference in the two teams once again. Yeah, but that's pretty impressive. I mean, it's about five minutes at this point. I think we had at least five or six kills already last game. But yeah, as you said, you know, we're still seeing nearly, you know, 700 or so gold difference just off of CS alone. And I, I have to say, I know they're down a little bit of gold right now, but I'm happy with this bounce back from Goon Squad. Mm -hmm. They needed to come into this game and slow things down a little bit relative to the way that the last game went. Yep. He's trying to make a sneaky play down bot lane. We'll see if he's able to reward it right now. Goon Squad is pushed in under their tower. You have to do get vision. Get Slayer not able to do anything. Citra knocks him away. Oh, he does take the Q back under tower as the flash out. Towers this early on do do a quite a bit of damage. Lee Sin does not have the tanky stats yet to survive that. A little bit of Lee Syndrome live and in person right there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, are we, do we have a fight going down mid lane here? The Akali's in a pretty good position with Vigar being flashless. Yep. Mostly just zoning them off right now. He is a bit low on man mana. Able to go in, get a good trade, and walk away after he puts out the baby cage. How close is this Akali to six? I think that, oh, there now. there's good play coming here. I can smell mm -hmm. it. Zin Zhao smells it too, and he's on his way over. Yep, Akali really getting aggro. If Redemption steps up just a little bit, I think that we'll definitely see Tall Guy commit. But the question becomes, oh, there it is. Baby Cage goes down, doesn't quite catch her. She does go under the tower, picks up the first blood. Takes enough tower damage, though, is not able to survive. That was real, real impressive by Dull Guy. He has shown in both games he's not afraid to commit to a fight, even a dive under tower. If he thinks he can secure something, he will do it. And you get a little bit of extra gold for the first blood there, mm -hmm. but I think that this is the problem. Under normal circumstances, I like that play, but you're suffocating the Vigor out of lane, and he has TP. You just burned your Ignite and your ulti. He's going to TP back to this lane and actually get back into it experience-wise and be able to catch a little bit of farm up on top. I don't know that diving there is necessarily going to be the best play for you in the long run when Vigar is the scaling champion of the two. Yeah, but it definitely gave them that advantage. But as you said, you know, Vigar was able to TP back. He's able to potentially freeze that lane near his tower, giving him a safe spot while he waits for his flash to cool down to come back. Um, it is pushing, however, right now. So, I mean, it, it does go right back to the Akali, but she definitely did miss out on some CS opportunities uh, having to walk back to lane while Vigar was able to TP in. Yeah, I mean, it went from a 27 CS gap to 14. That's pretty significant it actually almost completely removes the gold swing from the kill in the first big place. engage by tom off the top though he's able to put down a lot of damage eats the viego bring him away from his trap We're gonna spit him out put down a lot of damage there's the exhaust but it's pretty late coming out from oath meanwhile bot lane we did get a lot of damage going down on the force sparta able to burn heal and walk out of there 
That was really well played by uh, Adam Don't Miss and top lane, knowing the damage of Tom Kench and his tankiness, able to really bully uh, the Viego. And there was that little bit that we talked about last game where Wary made a good play holding Flash. In this case, Oath needed to just accept that he wasn't getting out of that one, and I think that he's going to kick himself later for burning that Flash. Yep, burned Flash and Exhaust. You know, maybe if he put down the exhaust a bit sooner, he could have prevented a lot of damage, but ultimately it just came out way too late to save him. Agreed. Oh. A lot of damage going down in the fourth part, though. Oh, Ooh. good flash to avoid the Lux, but there's the Lux all actually backs into it. Maristomatic able to pick that up. That dueling Lux combination with the Seraphine ulti and the Lux ulti could wind up being a lot of trouble if this game goes on. I wasn't sure about this bot lane duo, but if one ulti lands, the other one should land. Yep, and that's one thing I actually wanted to bring up a, a while ago, but the things have been so action-packed we haven't gotten a chance to. There's actually a little bit of anti-synergy between uh, the Syndra and the Nami pick. Um, when Syndra lands her stun combo, it's going to force back the uh, person that she hits. Uh, where Nami needed to follow up and land her bubble, it's such a small hit marker that that knockback might be just enough to put them out of uh, position to miss it. We saw it happen once earlier, but we, it went by too quickly to really comment on. So it's just got to be something that the Nami has to keep in mind when fighting. Meanwhile, though, we do have the engage coming down. Diego going in onto the double shank. A lot of damage coming out. He, he does have his ult up. He is able to dissuade any further pursuit. But that was a good bit of damage from Oath really quickly going down on to uh, the Xin Zhao. Yeah, and, and to touch back on your previous point, this is why when we were talking earlier about the bot lane on the side of the Goon Squad, I was questioning the makeup of the comp a little bit. Mm -hmm. Syndra does really well with other long-range kind of pokey champions like Swain or Brand or Morgana because she can set up a longer-range stun that doesn't synergize as poorly i feel like with nami you you really want to be auto attacking oh benefit. nami got caught out a lot of burst damage there she disappears doesn't even get out of the binding before she is gone yeah that's that's unfortunate whereas oh, meanwhile look at we got jin Zhao kind of being caught out here he's able to just walk away he was getting collapsed on by quite a few members of uh revenge of the middle sticks and on the other side of things, you've got the Lux and the Seraphine, who synergize really well in the way that like a Lux and a Morgana would, because you can just follow up bindings with bindings. Yeah, absolutely. Ooh, that Seraphine ulti almost killing the Cinder there. Yeah, but Lux ult uh, been back up at that point, you know, it's, it's nearly there, but had it been up, she would have been able to secure that kill with the CC and the low health with Syndra. Really just a lot of poke coming out, and they're really forcing uh, the Nami off. And meanwhile, we have a Kali coming in, Lux ult comes down immediately, there goes half her health, there goes the rest of it. Wow, really bullying the bot lane right now. Yeah, that was... Uh... That was a pretty pretty deep play there by a tall guy looking to speed up the course of this game a little bit. Oh, meanwhile, Tom Kent's trying to go in. Syndra getting caught out. Tall guy really just sticking around. Stun does not land. Damage coming out by tall guy able to secure the kill. Adam yeah, don't miss. Did miss. Tall guy going off to these side lanes and trying to accelerate the pace of the game again, making plays. He was getting antsy, the game was going a little too slow for him, and he's bust open a 3,000 gold lead for his team now. Yeah, absolutely. Now, right now, Tall Guy is doing a lot of what he did last game, doing a lot of roams and really trying to set the tempo. Um, and he's been pretty effective at it both games. Um, on the flip side, though, we do see Oath has really been kept in line by Adam Don't Miss this time around. I think that he's in a much more comfortable matchup. It's definitely not nearly as difficult of a matchup as the Cho'Gath into a set was the game before. Um, you know, they're about on par with CS. We got a, about a 6 CS differential here. Uh, but he has picked up that kill in the 1v1 where he was able to grab Oath and, you know, take him out. Yeah, I, I gotta say, this is a really nice bounce-back game from Adam because... 
He had a, a bit of a rough game the last time, and this time he had uh, a little bit less of an opportunity to to do what he wanted to do, and he, he's actually playing really well. I think he's slightly in the lead in that lane, actually. Yeah, no, I think he's definitely still setting the tempo. I mean, they both just finished uh, their mythic item. Meanwhile, we do have Xin Zhao kind of getting caught out here. He doesn't really have anywhere to go other than straight down. Uh, taking a lot of damage. They able to trade it back in on Mercedomatic. Ult comes out, but Tall Guy comes back on top of him, finishes him off there. Meanwhile, Force Sparta gets caught out down there. Taken down. Nami ult doesn't land. A lot of action just went down right there. Good roams coming out from uh, Revenge of the Middle Stick. Same as before, you know, they're really working together with that. Meanwhile, top lane. Oh, Adam don't miss. Picking up that Viego, Ch throwing him down under tower. He has to burn flash. Doesn't take any tower damage, but he does force his shield out. He's turning the damage back around, forces the flash. That was very well executed by Oath to turn that fight around. But now we're starting to get to the part of this matchup that I was talking about with you earlier, where Viego has finished his Bork. At this point, he has his namesake weapon. And he deals so much health damage and heals so much that most health tanks, like a Tom Kench, are just butter versus a hot knife. Yeah, absolutely. He was able to put down that exhaust to really help him sustain the long, drawn-out fight where he was able to heal up. Really allowed him to turn the tables there. Meanwhile, though, we do have a potential fight breaking out here. Oh! He flashed back, trying to avoid the snare, but he still got hit, allowing them to just drop all the follow-up damage. The real story of this oh, Tom is going for the fight. He wants it. Meanwhile, Jin Zhao a little bit slow to respond. It does get here now, though. They've managed to put down the stun. Yep, just keep backing out, Tom, and you will be able to grab that. Good job. Kill secured by uh, Don't Shank. That'll help uh, the Xin Zhao to get back into this match. You know, very snowball -y champion. Yeah, it, it hurts when you get behind on those snowball -y champions, but the real story of this game, last game it was the, the solo lanes that told the tale of the game. This game, it's the off-meta bot lanes, and between the bot lanes, there's almost a 5,000, no, 4,000 gold split right now with both bot laners on the side of Return of the Middle Six being 2,000 gold above their counterparts. Yeah, definitely a very bot-dominated game uh, for Return of the Middle Six. I mean, mid lane is still able to, you know, they, Tall Guy's picked up a lot of kills off of his roams and everything, and he has a very large CS lead. On top of that, he's definitely done well in the role. Uh, Redemption played safe, same as he did last game. He's trying to force a fight right now with uh, Xin Zhao, but he's able to walk away. Meanwhile, Lux comes on and giving the Kali the go sign. There's the ultimate. Lux doesn't land. Meanwhile, Tall Guy able to secure a, pretty much Solo's 1v2 since Lux uh, really just gave moral support there. She goes back in underneath the tower, bursts them down with the help of Lux, and is able to get out of there. Two for nothing. Very well played uh, by Revenge of the Middle Sticks there. This game's getting into the uh, the 8,000 gold window that's going to be a lot of difficulty. While lacking a traditional ADC may make it easier to stall the game out. Oh, Seraphine all goes down, able to pull them back in, and Maristomatic coming in to pick up and secure the kill. Yeah, gets rid of a lot of their way clear opportunity, but yep, they don't really have anything to follow up and continue siege in, so gonna back off for right now. Yeah, and as you were saying though, neither team is a traditional ADC, so neither team can really take towers particularly quickly, um, and both have good way clear options between uh, their bot lane choices. Jin getting really aggressive with that, but now he's caught out all on his own, gets burned down, has to flash away, Seraphine's pushing him down, Lee Sing flashes after them, kicks him, he's still surviving though, there's the cue to finish it off, meanwhile, where he has to drop ball, trying to move away, Vigar is there, puts on the baby cage, uh, able to save him, Seraphine's still pushing, but yep, they are going to disengage now, having picked up their two kills. Yeah, this, this game's starting to get a little bit out of hand. I, I don't I don't know what you do. Oh. Yeah, even at that point, Lux just 
threw out her EQ combo and was pretty much able to 100 to 0 for Sparta there. Oh, Akali's going in, putting down a lot of damage. Tom eats his Vigar, saves him for a little bit, but it's not going to be enough. Meanwhile, the tower does take down, oh, does not take down Gid Slayer. The double shank is there to, to cure it. Tom's still going for him, gets stunned down, doesn't, oh, does have a shield. He is able to survive. Game keeps proving me wrong. Luxol does not land. Double shank kind of wants it, but it's a bit of a challenge to get in on somebody. He sees the Akali, he's hoping to do it, but she is burning his health bar down. Does she have any way to go for it? What is going to break out here next? Well, right after we were praising them for keeping it to be a slower game, here we are up over a kill a minute again. Yeah, not quite as high as it was before. I think at this point last game, what did we have? Uh, my math blunder, about 26 kills on the board last game at this point. Give or take a little bit. That's fair, but it feels like these teams are both just starting to ramp up. And given the current team comps return of the middle sticks scales significantly better than goon squad so you gotta worry a little bit about how they're feeling they gotta be feeling like they need to push the pace of this game now yeah i can't say i disagree with you here meanwhile vigar walks into them seraphine ult's able to get them stunned dot in he does pop uh after Meanwhile, Akali's still trying to pick up kills. She does secure the kill on Denami. Doesn't quite finish off the Vigar. Zin Zhao knocks her up. He's chasing her down. I don't think she has a way to escape, but he doesn't land. Yeah. Doesn't matter. The burn takes him out anyways. Wow. So well, two for two, uh, two v three, and it still managed to go two for two there. But even if you go two for two there, that's a huge swing in the favor of Goon Squad because one of those two kills was worth three kills. <laughs> Yeah, quite. Oh, meanwhile, is Lee Sin getting turned around on Tom Kench with the E onto the double shank, avoiding the Lux ult, saving him from a lot of damage there. Well played by Adam Don't Miss. They are able to pick up the kill on Lee Sin. Oh, he does get the slowdown into Lux. She's going to have her snare up in a second. Yep, so Adam moved away to avoid the prediction there, but didn't come out anyways. In what has been an otherwise slightly rougher game for Goon Squad, Adam don't miss having a fantastic game for himself on this Tom Kench right now. Yeah, I have to agree with you. Adam has done some fantastic plays this game and has really had a complete turnaround from his past uh, matches. Meanwhile, though, Vigar flashed over the wall to get this engage on the Seraphine. They're throwing a lot at her. She knows she's caught, not going to try and get away. It doesn't have healer flash anyways. Meanwhile, bot lane, though, they're just le le running away from the Akali. Not enough to save the Nami. And Double Shank, again, performing really well on the Bruiser. The difficulty for him this time, I think, is on Zin Zhao. The gold doesn't go as far, so even with his team down almost 7k gold, he has the most gold in the game. Yeah. Well, Akali just passed him, but Akali and Zin Zhao sitting on the most gold in the game right now. The problem is Akali uses it better as the numbers get higher. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, we're definitely seeing a repeat of Tall Guy getting really ahead in this. You know, he's abusing his leads, he's roaming a lot, but we have Hikar coming in. Dead Man's Plate? Or no, he burned, uh, not Dead Man's Plate, what's the boots called? Predator. Oh, Predator, thank you. Tom Kench cut him off, though. Is she going to be able to escape? She has her Shroud out, kind of moving around them. Shroud goes away, burns a lot of damage on the Syndra, but isn't able to put him out. Has to flash away, gets slowed down. There's going to be the Tom knockup. She dodges it, though. Bubble misses. She's throwing down everything she has, but it's not going to be enough. There's too much CC, too much damage, and too many people. Meanwhile, though, they are burning mid-tower there, seeing the opportunity yeah. without anybody there to really stop them. No wave clear present at that point in time. Yeah. Taking their time with the tower to do what they can. Ooh. Oh, Jin's getting burned down. He's charmed right now. No chance to move. No chance to drop alt CC until death. There's a stun coming out of Syndra. They're just going to kind of do some damage, zone them off. Lee Sin is caught in the baby cage, is able to get out. Nami ult comes out, but the wave doesn't catch anybody. Very importantly there, though, they managed to hold their base turret, which oh. needs to be one of their priorities. Yes, meanwhile, bot lane, Adam don't miss. I don't know if that was the right fight to take at this point. Oath, although he's 0-2, has a lot of damage behind him. 
Not sure if your inherent tankiness is going to be enough to save you. Trying to turn around, trying to pop down damage, but there goes his shield. Spit him out. Maybe he can escape if his W's back up in time. Oh, he threw him the wrong way. Better try to predict the flash that never came. Meanwhile, though, mid lane Lee Syndrome coming in a little bit. Forgot about Syndra having ult. Able to drop a lot of damage on him, and his teammates secured the kill. Yeah, Redemption having a slightly better game. Able to scale. Oh, Akani coming in, though. There's no time to talk and dissect things because damage is going down across the board. Uh, Oath is taking over. Nami, he's going in. <laughs> Oh man, this has been non-stop action. There we have a fight, Oath going in against Double Shank. Who has the more damage? I think Oath has sustained, but damage is not enough to keep him going. Double Shank has enough base damages to take him out. That's the sneaky thing when you think that you're way ahead in the game, but there's somebody on the other team that has more gold than anybody else. You make mistakes and you just keep perpetuating that. That was another big shutdown for Double Shank, mm -hmm. who continues to be the gold leader in this game, despite being on a team down 10k. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and on top of that, when they lost Oath, they lost their ability to keep pressure and keep pushing, so that mid and hip is still there. They weren't able to secure it when they didn't have uh, Oath to keep up uh, pressure in frontline for them. Still, though, they did break the base, which, as we had talked about, you know, wave clear is a big issue for both teams and their lack of ability to take towers. Without that tower now, they can just kind of group mid and force that fight for the mid and hip. Also, of significant import, we talked a little bit earlier about the scaling and how it favors the return of the middle sticks. We're starting to see second items come online and third items get built on the side of return of the middle sticks, whereas we still don't have second items online for Goon Squad, and I worry that that does not bode well for them as this game progresses. Kali's threatening to die Viger under tower, but he is able to land the stun of her and able to burst her with the help of the tower, takes her out. The tall guy got a little bit too aggressive there. Meanwhile, fight over the dragon does go down to return Revenge of Middle Sticks. Big fight coming out. It's 4v3, it looks like right now. Viger is still not there. Lots of damage. Nami Wave comes in. They do take out the Tom Kench. Lux Alt does not land on anybody. Meanwhile, they're trying to back out. Vigar is here, but he has no health. Baby Cage comes out. A little bit of damage. His, he's taken down. Lee Sin engages onto the Jin Zhao now. He's able to secure both of those kills with the help of his team. Meanwhile, the bot lane of Goon Squad trying to get out of there. And they're the that last men such, standing. Such a huge Seraphine ulti. Oh, that yeah. Seraphim he caused Adam don't miss what was left of his life and really cracked open the entire team for Return of the Middle Sticks to push through. Oh yeah, even though Tall Guy had gotten picked off in the side lane with his failed dive there, he still knocked Redemption down low enough and kept him out of the fight long enough that by the time he arrived, most of the fight had pretty much ended and was really just cleaning up and chasing down targets. Meanwhile, we're grouping around the Baron. Looks like they've started it. Lux and Lee Sin put it down damage. I mean, I think at this point, if you're Goon Squad, you have to go for it, you know. 50-50 odds to see if you can come back. This is part of the difficulty when you're this far behind. You don't have the vision. You don't have the ability to check safely or easily. Oh, Lux ult alone nearly soloed the Nami. Followed up with Seraphine ult able to finish her off. Yeah, as you are saying, vision. Yeah, Tom Kench trying to fight Tall Guy 1v1. Vigar flashes out of a bad situation. Good move on his end. Tom, I don't know if you want to keep fighting that because here comes the rest of Revenge of the Middle, uh, middle Sticks. Uh, and yep, he's going to go down. His health bar is not big enough. While Oath is now cosplaying as Tom Kench. We'll see what he does with that. They do force them off the tower. Yep, Oath is there. That's a great delivery for Viego. Luxalt comes down. Not quite enough for Sparta. Walking away, trying to get back to base. Heal up. But importantly enough to push them off of this turret. Absolutely. And, and you have to wonder if we're looking at the end of the game here. 
You got supers in two lanes and Baron buff on. I think Revenge of the Middle Sticks could force this issue if they want to, especially with the Tom Finch dead. Adam is back in 10 seconds. Meanwhile, Gitchlayer is still gone. No good way to get back. They do trade a lot of damage down onto them. They are forcing them back off. Nobody's really hitting the tower though, except for the minions. It does fall off. Second tower is still there. Good. Adam don't miss. She's back. Akali going in, just kind of distracting and zoning them at the moment. She does go down. They have no towers left, however. The remaining of the uh, Revenge of the Middle Sticks backing off. They know it's 3v5, and they can always come back another day. Well, I think that's just a chicken play. You're <laughs> a 13,000 gold, and you're not going to smack them when Well, they're sticking them. around a little bit. Leeson's nearly back there. Meanwhile, Oath is just healing so much as he keeps on fighting. So he did get eaten up, spit back out, and burst down. Oh boy, Oath. Tell your team. They should have backed you up. Yeah, your they... supports are running away. <laughs> Well, Aeropox and Maristomatic were putting down what damage they could safely. You gotta remember, if they get caught by pretty much anybody, they're pretty much deleted. Yeah, well, you got a massive Viego. You just trust him sometimes. <laughs> I know he hasn't had the best game relative to his standards, I'm sure. But you've got a three item, almost three item, mid to late game Viego. A just... lot of damage went down on top catch right there. Holy cow. Yeah, Dragon's going to be coming up shortly, so it looks like they're just going to back off, do Dragon, probably reset, and try to make one final push to end the game. Yeah, and it, it's looking like third item is almost coming through on all of Revenge of the Middle Sticks. Uh, third item on their Seraphine, third item on their Akali. Looks like Lee and Viego are within a few hundred. But I think you're right. I think the play for them right now is to hang around this Dragon Soul. Most Dragon Souls have something absurd like a 90 plus percent win rate once you secure them. Yeah, sounds about right. You know, ooh, Redemption, not in a great spot, but pretty much everything misses except for the Lux E. They do manage to put down a lot of damage. He does not have Flash. He does go down. So it will be a 4v5 trying to defend this base here. Am don't miss. It's about a little over half HP left at the moment. Dragon Soul is up for Revenge of the Middle Sticks. Mm. Yep. yep, looks like they're playing a safe, backing off, doing Dragon. So Redemption will be back for the final push. Oath is just kind of splitting alone on his own. He's able to find Jin Zhao. Nobody's really here able to help him right now. Meanwhile, Tall Guy's fucking around with Adam Don't Miss. They do secure Dragon, and Jin backs away. I would normally be more critical of that, but I think that in this particular case, when you're on the team that scales oh, better... He picks out Wary, able to secure that kill. Meanwhile, it's 1v4, they're fighting, and Oath does not survive. Well, bot lane, though, they do force down that inhib. Mid inhib is respawned, but it doesn't particularly matter when you got supers crashing on top in the big wave bot lane. Tall guy's engaged on the... Luxol comes down, bursts him down. Tom is called out. He's Getting chunked, trying to survive, not able to do a double shank. Seeing if he can survive, tower does or fountain tower does manage to pick up a revenge kill on the Lee Sin, but they're able to walk away. That will be game two going down for Revenge of the Middle Sticks. I mean, it was a well played start of the game again by Goon Squad trying to come through, fix a couple of their mistakes, but uh, a little bit of questionable drafting honestly on both sides it just synergized a little bit better in the favor of return of the middle sticks yeah i have to agree with you i think that their team comps and drafts in both games were in their favor um they definitely played around to their their key strengths of their mid lane and uh, bot lane i think in both games really able to power through quite well um you know, Goon Squad definitely did better in Game 2 than they did in Game 1, I believe. You know, Game, I think, lasted a little bit longer. They were able to, to keep uh, reduced gold leads uh, in the second game than they were in the first game. Um, 
And I think, you know, their draft was improved over their first game draft. Adam don't miss coming around with a much better Tom Kench game uh, and had some fantastic moments, some good saves uh, with his teammates throughout the series. Yeah, I, this second game, I got to say, there was a big bounce back from the solo lanes on the side of Goon Squad. They both had a bit of a rough first game, but they, they rounded it up. And while Redemption struggled to make his presence known, when you're playing that farming mage and you've got a roaming assassin, it's going to be hard to get the game started. And once he came online, though, a little bit better, he made some really good plays, even soloing Tall Guy a couple of times. Yeah, absolutely. You know, kind of letting Tall Guy get ahead of himself in uh, that late game, especially in the second game, diving under tower. He was well played uh, by Redemption, locking him down and, you know, tur- got himself with that solo kill. It was well done. All right, so it's that time. It's time to pick an MVP for the series. Oh, man, this is always so difficult because there's very rare times where you're going to have that singular person that you can call MVP. Uh, In game one, I might have given it to uh, Oath with his set, but his performance in game two was just more middling, so I don't think he quite deserves that title. Um, I think I'm going to have to give it to the mid laner of Revenge of the Middle Sticks, whose name right now I am forgetting, and I feel so bad for that. Uh, he popped off heavily with the Akali, popped off heavily with the Yone, really dictated the terms of the game, the tempo, and uh, the direction that everything took. So I, I, would, I was going to say for the first game, Oath probably would have been my pick, but Talex Guy would have been my kind of second pick. And in the second game, I think Aeropox probably would have been my number one pick, but Talex Guy probably would have been my second pick. And so by the merit of just picking up more points over the course of two games, I think that his side lane plays were really, really good. And they really helped keep Double Shank down in both games. Both games, Double Shank performed really well and had a couple of opportunities to try to get ahead of Shade Slayer and take over the game. But he couldn't even get into his own jungle because Tall Guy was just all over the place. Yeah, uh, I, I fully agree with that. I think if you know we were to award uh, MVP to the losing team on Goon Squad, I'd have to give it to uh, Ga- or Double Shank. You know, he definitely performed fairly well in both games, especially particularly well in the second game. Um, you know, it was a tough series for for Goon Squad, but ultimately, I think he was their best saving grace. I think in the second game, I, I would put Adam a little bit above him, but we were talking about, or I was talking about how he had the most gold in the game a couple of points in time. And I'm a little biased being a jungler, but it's hard to have the most gold in the game as a jungler on a losing team. Particularly yeah, particularly when you're playing an early game duelist like Xin Zhao. So I think both games, Double Shank really showed well for himself. Uh Second game, Adam don't miss earns himself an honorable mention. Um, but I, I do agree with you. I think that uh, our ace and our MVP for this series are going to be Double Shank and Tall X Guy. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you all for tuning in to our casting. Uh, it's been a fantastic time here with Cage Reaper. I think we're going to close it out. Uh, Cage, any final remarks? Well, I hope you all enjoyed it. We had a great banger of a game between Return of the Middle Sticks and the Goon Squad. And I thank Karen Franz for having me on. So for Karen Franz, for myself, Cage the Cage Reaper, and for all of Seal, thanks for joining us. Have a good night.